Oh, I can definitely, I can definitely Ooh. understand why you would, you'd go for no stands. You could just chill here. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Otherwise, before I had to pull out the couch, right? Okay, yeah. and then put a because it, it's actually the clamps are too thin for the table. If it was right. just if it's fat and the t- fit in the table, yeah, yeah, it yeah. make my life a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but instead, I have to move the couch, put another little bedside table, and then clip the clamps onto that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Got you. And yeah, it's just it's like one more thing to do. It's like, nah, it's yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. If there's a more permanent setup, I'll mm. just do it. Yeah. But I mean. This is because it's a little bit more um, on the fly. It just makes my life so much easier. It's more chilled as well. Yeah, I think I think so as well. It's a yeah. little bit less like, oh, we're on a proper yeah, podcast yeah, 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 yeah. or something. This right. a, th- we're not Joe Rogan level yet. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you said yet. You know, I, it's coming. <laughs> I have faith in it. Honestly, I do. I, I do. All right, I really well, look, do. I appreciate it, brother. All right, the levels are looking pretty good. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I think we're happy with that. I'll um, shift if I need to. I'll have a little squeeze every now and then. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll get me some water, mate. Just oh, as a man, poor gentleman. What? See, this is what I mean by yet, right? A good host will always attract good people in their lives. And good people is good podcasts, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, we're yet to find out whether you're good people. On well, the that that's true. That so, is true. But then, so. if, you know, if you're not good people, I guess it would make it very. This interesting. podcast will never come out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd probably yeah. t- be too good a content not to to put out. Well, we'll see, we can charge people some money extra. We'll build up the business <laughs> a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I haven't had that happen so far. I haven't had to. Uh, um, purposely deny pod so far so there's oh, been yeah, no yeah, one yeah. no one of well, that ill character touch wood this yeah. doesn't happen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you could be the first <laughs> is it a good thing or bad thing yeah. well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see so jordan man um yes. it's been funny enough what we met would have met late last year initially one of the backpacker meetups yep. yeah uh, or was that the volleyball that we first met up yeah. it was no, a meetup it was a meetup it was a meetup that you had organized with a few of your friends to do a barbecue yep. slash beach day yep, yep, yep um which i just thought was really cool you know to not just to host like a, a little meetup and games for people to get together but the fact that you guys went out your way as well to put on a, a barbecue as well for people and to provide the food as well. Because I remember messaging you and saying, oh, hey, man, like, I'm going to be coming down. Um, do I need to bring any food or stuff like that? And then you reply with, don't worry about it. If you don't, you can if you want, but we've got some food, um, so don't stress out about it. And, you know, for me, that was like, wow, like, these these guys are really doing this for the best interest of everyone, you know, and really want to get everybody together and make it as easy as possible for them um and when i got there i was just so shocked with just how much after meeting you guys you guys were really serious about getting people together you know i i was expecting it might just be just a simple facebook group chat or a simple meetup where it might only happen once or twice and then that's it. But I could really see that it's something that you guys have been kind of had a passion for for a long time. And then when we spoke about it more last weekend and talking about Waytree, um, then I was like, wow, like these guys are really onto something here. You know, like there's, yes, there is lots of Facebook pages, but there's not many Facebook pages that give you the accessibility to put yourself in contact with other people who are also in the same same situation as you, visiting Australia on a working holiday visa or backpacking, whatever, to be able to connect with each other and then also find things to do with each other. So I just thought it was really cool. Mate, I mean, I feel like I don't need to do any ads now. I'm just going to get you to do all that promotional work, get it, do everything forward. But it was funny because that was, uh, I think, one of the first we'd done in a little while. And the plan was to try and roll out as many as possible when I'm back from the mines. Yeah. Uh, to, yeah, basically do that. Like, what makes sense to do? Barbecue makes sense. It's mm-hmm. near enough by. Yeah. Sausages are one of the few things in Australia which haven't risen a million percent in price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, you can sort of put something together, mm-hmm. uh, which is a lot of... F- and ultimately, it has to be fun. Yeah. Both for myself and for the people there. Yeah, yeah, of course. If, you, if you're doing something that you're not really 
able to enjoy yourself, like people are going to pick up on that. Yeah, you, know, you can't pretend a hundred percent that you're having a, a good time. But uh, it was very fun to. I think you'd come down and you were one of, and this is like the classic. UK person in Australia, and particularly yeah. Perth, the first time, and you're about as red as can oh. possibly be. <laughs> On oh, me and like, so I I lived in Spain most of my <laughs> life, right? And the, this is the thing that annoys me the most is the fact that I I've lived in Spain for over twenty years. I moved over my family when I was about four, and even after living in Spain for a long time, having really hot summers like Australia my body is just a magnet to the sun especially <laughs> my nose like I've been called Rudolph the red nose reindeer like when I saw you the other day at the beach I even you asked you <laughs> I said can you have a look at my neck because it feels like it's on fire right now and sure behold it was I got home and I looked in the mirror and I was like Jesus Christ Jordan like stay away from the beach a little bit more <laughs> like and I do put sun cream on like I I, I put it on I, I put it on twice I think whilst I was down there um but I just don't think twice is good enough I guess in Australia I think Damn. you got put it three four times but I envy everyone when I was down at the beach because I didn't really see anyone really putting any sun cream on and I'm there putting it on everywhere <laughs> twice you know and I'm leaving there red wall and everyone else has just got this luscious tan on their skin <laughs> you know so well we can't have uh we can't Kind of everything maybe you don't have yeah. the tan but instead maybe there's some attribute that's made up for it you know wow. we'll hopefully find out soon ho enough ho hopefully find out soon <laughs> enough um i'm holding some on to my power. yeah <laughs> i'm holding on to my head hair as much as possible as well that's slowly going <laughs> on the top <laughs> so we'll have to wait and see unfortunately my younger brother he's only a year younger but the he's already getting the in the old ball patch on the top um, so hopefully my head hair stays until I'm at least like 35, nearly 40, just for dating reasons. <laughs> After that, then I'm Then you're happy for care. it to go out. Once yeah, you got your partner, yeah. it's like, go, Yeah, once you got my partner, it's like, well, yeah. damn, girl, you, you've subscribed to this. <laughs> you've subscribed to this relationship, so <laughs> this is what you're going to get. Well, look, you've actually got the ability to grow out the front hair because yes. I find anyone that goes bold, as long as you can grow a beard, not that you have to, but no. as long as you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. there is some sort of balance option in the world yeah. i can only grow a mo yeah quite yeah. literally there mm -hmm. isn't the availability of any form of beard so if i do go bold and you've got a good mo as well i do. do thank you i you pr do. Look, you appreciate you that one Again. i think there's quite an aussie thing as well to compliment each other on each other's uh, mustaches i was driving to work today <laughs> and i was listening on the radio and one of the one of the presenters was talking about how a boyfriend just randomly got stopped in public and was told that he had a great mustache and the guy that had complimented him also had a mustache as well so <laughs> I think it's, a, it's an unwritten code that yeah we have. yeah I, I think it is before i actually i normally do just go uh clean shave mustache i was going to do it this afternoon but i didn't have time i got home uh, late from work um but yeah this past year i've been clean um been wearing like cleave shave mustache is that in homage to the australian look no, no. <laughs> but, but when I st when I told my family and that that I was coming over to Australia, they thought it was because of that. And I was like, no. When I used to travel a couple of years ago around Asia, I did do it because I didn't know anyone over there, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> I, you thought you could pay, take some chances. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had full confidence, you know. Don't know anyone. Get the mustache out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> when I got back home, the mustache was gone, <laughs> you know. All, oh, okay. the, all the all the pedo jokes were coming out you know and stuff like that and i was like yeah i can't handle these jokes right now it's really hurting my <laughs> ego um but it was only till last year when i was like don't care what anyone says i'm gonna rock the mustache so i did and then yeah so I, i've rocked the mustache ever since i just i need to just clean shave everywhere else well i don't know if it, it's a cultural thing in, over in the uk as mm. well but the Australian firefighters yeah. can only rock a moustache because you can't actually have other facial hair okay. due to the oxygen mask or whatever that you need to wear to go into burning buildings. Oh, so they have okay. a requirement that it, you can't have any facial hair except for the mo. Okay. So we've slowly transitioned out of the pedophile porn star mo. <laughs> okay. And now it's like the fireys right, are the okay. ones with the mo. And where I work on the mines, I work with emergency services yeah. and they can only grow a mo as well. Right, okay, and now I'm doing okay, some okay. training there so I can only grow a mo, which works perfectly for me right, anyway. Nice, okay, <laughs> so, okay. So I don't Damn. know if it's the same UK, but yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Well, I need to like clip that bit because and send it to my friends and family and go, look, <laughs> it's cool, okay? It's not nothing pedo related. It's cool. I'm staying in Australia. I'm not coming home. Unless of course you are a pedo and then Yeah, well then listen, mustache, you know? to get rid of that mustache. At least don't make it obvious. <laughs> <laughs> you know? If you're gonna be a pedo, don't make it obvious. <laughs> but um yeah, so in the UK, I can't really speak too much for the UK because like I said, I I moved I away from say. the UK when I was about four years old. Um, but in Spain, no one really rocks a mustache. It's not really a Spanish thing. S Spanish people love to be clean shaved and they'll go far enough to shave all their chest hair, shave their arm hair and leg hair as well. Um, it's just the sort of look that they prefer, especially guys that are in their early adulthood and teenage years as well. Um, so yeah, mustaches and, and mullets definitely aren't a thing. So when you do see it, you know, normally the first thing is, an, is, is a pedo joke, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> we, Actually, being in Spain for that long, you must have been also like one of the widest people there still, right? Well, so where I lived was a very touristy expat area. So uh, okay. it yeah. was more for people that were retiring um, because the UK weather is not that great. So a lot of people in their 50s, 60s decide that they want to retire. So they move to Spain because it's nice and sunny, you know, and their alcohol and food's a lot cheaper, which I understand. Um, personally, for me, as a young person or if I had a family and I was in my 30s, 40s, I probably wouldn't move in those areas. I'd probably move to more cultural areas like the big cities, Madrid, Barcelona, you know, because like my parents, for example, they don't speak any Spanish at all. Did you guys not learn whilst over there? Yeah, so I my, I speak Spanish through school and stuff like yeah, that. Okay. But like... Um, Your parents just didn't have to pick it up. Yeah, just parents. They never had to pick it up. Supermarkets, um, what else? Restaurants. Most of the time they were they were owned by English speaking people, Irish, Scottish, uh, where at Scandinavian. So you could just walk into anywhere. Hi, can I have a large beer? You know, you didn't have to nah. use any Spanish or stuff like that as well. So it's funny then because then when people come over from the UK and they go to a bar, they're not really aware of this. So they go, can I get a una pinta, por favor? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, mate, you don't actually need to practice your Spanish. <laughs> like, That's always a little bit sad. I feel like that would be one of the, I guess, long-term benefits of moving to a country yeah. that has a different language mm -hmm. would be sort of the forcing yourself into having to pick that language up. Yeah. But I guess, you know, if you're retiring, you're probably like, ah, who cares? I'm yeah. Not bothered. I think it depends on what you're looking for when you're... If, if you're going to retire, I mean, not to sound bad, but you're. it's harder to learn a new language when you're old than it is when you're younger. Sure. Like when, when you're when you're a kid, you, your brain's like a sponge. You pick up languages so easily, you know. But when you're older, it is a lot difficult. And obviously when you're retiring, you're not really doing much as well. You're kind of taking life a bit more easier. So you're not really putting yourself in a lot of positions where you do need to use your um, the second language depending on where you are in the world. But I do definitely would say that if, you're, if you are kind of young or you've got a family and they're young, get them into the culture, whatever country you're in, get them into the culture and get yourself into the culture as well. Because the last thing, like, for example, homework, I'd have Spanish homework and my parents couldn't help me because they didn't yeah. speak the language. <laughs> <laughs> you know? well, at least now you can speak in your own code. They're like, God damn it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can say whatever. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, it, say isn't it with it a smile. And she'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. I'm like, She's got no idea. <laughs> you know? So um, do you still, like, did you have UK mates growing up as well? Like the, yeah. you were still living in, you know, UK, London, wherever? Yeah, so I don't have actually... Um, Mates from the UK, I didn't really have any because I left when I was four. I kind of yeah, just okay. left the last year of like kindergarten. Um, so I was, I, was, I was trying to think like what, you know, um, did you have any comparison as to your life being a very different form of bring mm -hmm. upbringing compared to, you know, what you would have been your upbringing, I guess, wherever yeah. you originally came from in England? Did N not really, just because I was so young. Yeah. The only thing I could really point out which would be a big obvious was the weather you know going from somewhere where it was rainy cold to being then sunny most of the time as well um and like before moving to spain i do remember i do have like flash memories of being with certain friends but i don't remember their names i just remember oh we was on the trampoline or i was you in their room Bastard. Yeah, listen, <laughs> if you recognise me, I'm sorry, you know, I think one of them was called Kieran, 
um, but it could be called Ted. <laughs> like, How dare you not keep in touch yeah. with your four-year-old Yeah, friends. like, what was I doing not having a mobile phone and Facebook back then, you know? Like, <laughs> should on, have mate. got their Snapchat Roll at least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, but... So, um, you, you, you've, you've been brought up through Spain, so did you literally come from Spain to Australia? Like, what sort of uh, journey-wise? How did yeah, you- so journey-wise, I came from Spain to Australia. I did have a few layovers, uh, some long layovers. Um, but yeah, so from Spain to Australia. And what sort of prompted, you know, had were there multiple places in mind or what was the draw card, I guess, of coming to Oz? Yes, yeah, so originally I was drawn to Canada first. Um, so I was looking into Canada and it Canada looks lovely and it looks like an amazing place and it's also a place where a lot of people go um, to live and work for a couple of years but the only big setback I saw with Canada was how high their taxes were and their taxes were around 40 to 50 percent almost Um, and my idea was I was looking for somewhere where I could potentially live permanently it was I, I wasn't looking for somewhere where I was kind of just maybe travel for a couple of years, then go back home. I was looking for somewhere more permanent. So for me, Canada wasn't an option then because I was like, it's going to be really hard to try and save money and try and work on a future there. Whereas Australia, the taxes aren't too high. They're still kind of high, but they're not too high. And the pay is still high in Australia as well. So it kind of balanced out in that aspect. And obviously, all the great things that I've heard about Australia, the people, just the views, the things to do, just how diverse Australia is as well. So, Did you have any mates that were thinking doing similar things or was this sort of like you're a bit of a black sheep making your way out to do yeah, something like so this? Yeah, so I've had friends in the past that have brought it up um, and talked about it. When I w- started off travelling um, about four or five years ago when I was around Southeast Asia – obviously meeting a lot of people that had just come from Australia or in between uh, being in Australia and traveling at the same time. Um, I definitely thought about it then, but my focus at the time then was just Asia, use your money for Asia. Australia is a lot more expensive, so that would have to be its own journey in itself. Um, And then my ex-girlfriend, she actually moved over here last year and she was telling me how awesome it was I was starting to see then some of her posts the places that she's been and the things that she's doing and I was like wow it really is like what you see on social media and what you hear from people as well because you know a lot of people that come over to Australia or are or Australian people have some sort of um, connection with the UK family from the UK so you always hear in the UK a lot of stories of family members that have lived over there whether it's grandparents cousins or whatever and you ask them and they go it's amazing and I wouldn't change it for the world I wouldn't think about moving back and then I got here and I was like I understand now why you know (laughs) and I understand why a lot of Australians probably don't you know, venture out and travel that much as well is because they don't really need to in a sense because, you know, Australia is very diverse. So you've got a bunch of different cultures around you. You've got loads of different climates as well. If you're looking for more tropical, you can go up north to Queensland and stuff like that. You've got all the lovely beaches. If you're looking for deserty sort of climate as well, you've got that in Northern Territory and the middle of Australia. So there's, yeah, if you didn't want to, you didn't have to leave as well, I guess. Yeah, well, we've got the benefit of, uh, you would have heard about the big lap yes. that people do where, yeah, you can, you sort of do get a little glimpse or microcosm of sort of different world places where it doesn't feel like you may be in the same country. And yeah. as you said, going up to your northern Queensland where it's yeah. hyper-tropical, yeah, yeah. going a little bit more into the middle or near Uluru where you're mm-hmm. complete desert and Kimberley as well where you've just got this amazing contrast of earthy dirt red beautiful iron ory colors yeah, mixed yeah, across yeah. with that like blue sky and then if you want the cold you can still make your way over east coast yeah. look inland you've got i mean some even tassie is meant to be really cold as well from what from what i've heard can, yeah tasmania and can get quite cold as well and tasmania is definitely on your your list if really, you're yeah. a hiker okay if you're yeah. a big nature lover yeah, you know, yeah, yeah tasmania yeah. does kill right, it okay. with that for for the size of it and the density mm. and going around it is uh it, it's definitely known as one of the more i don't know if you call it like a pure nature but uh fair like pretty untouched okay yeah, pretty yeah, well yeah. protected right, all throughout yeah. tasmania so uh, yeah definitely gets a few points from that end so you 
you'd start to, you'd start to develop a little bit of a okay, I think Australia is the place mm. to go, or at least Australia, Canada, and then maybe the tax got you over the line. Yeah, which yeah, yeah. It's nice to hear that we're not considered the worst taxing nation. No, I, I th- honestly, like when I was looking into Canada, for example, I was watching some like YouTube videos and stuff like that, and even the locals there were like. Yeah, we're not even at one point thinking about owning a house at any point in our lifetime. And these people were like, they were couples with really good jobs, uh, software engineers or um, uh, really well-paid surgeons, doctors or whatnot. And just the prices of the apartments or housing over there. And then the taxing on top of that is just, it's impossible for them. And so many, even people that moved over there now, I saw videos of people getting asked who had moved over there saying, do you regret moving to Canada? And a lot of people were like, yeah, I actually do. Which I was so surprised, you know. Wow. It's a shame because I know Canada is a really beautiful country and everyone knows Canada is like really friendly people as well. Yeah. So I definitely will go, but I think it will just be for a vacation, for a trip. Um, unless anything changes with like the tax side of things, I don't see myself being able to financially move over there, really. So when you were, again, you were like, all right, so pick in Australia, let's mm. go there, hopefully to find somewhere to stay more long term. And then did you do a travel around the country or you've, did you decide, like, I'm just going to go straight to... Uh, yeah, how did you pick, I guess, where you were going to come into? Yeah, so I kind of picked Perth first, mainly because... It's the first point of contact to the rest of the world, I guess, from the rest of the West Western world. Um, and also, the flights were kind of cheaper as well, <laughs> in that sense. <laughs> like, I was kind of like, I was being a bit stingy, you know, because obviously, compared to Europe, Australia is a bit more expensive, but I wasn't quite sure how much more expensive it was going to be. So I wanted to be smart in the sense of, okay, the visa is going to be at least six to seven hundred dollars the flights are going to be around a thousand no, more than that a thousand and a half two thousand dollars i kind of want to play it smart financially so then when i do get to australia i can then kind of work out how much everything's costing um and then in a sense then i can then begin when i do eventually travel around australia i then can do the loop from you know uh, west to east and then hopefully do then east background uh, up north and then uh, right back in Perth. So they were my main reasons to visit Perth. And also I was looking up Perth and I was like, it's lovely. It's got a lovely city, lovely beaches. Like, why wouldn't I want to stop here, you know, as well? So, Oh, yeah. So you, <coughs> you came into Perth. Um, well, I really should have done that outside of the mic. Uh, <laughs> so you came into Perth and then for you, it is the plan to try and do uh, like tours? Is it more mm. get a car and go around? Do you, yeah. Are you having a sense of what you want to do or that's still something that you're figuring out so it's something that i'm figuring out at the moment because i am in two minds with what i want to do with my time in australia because like i said i do i do kind of want to live here permanently so i because i'm on a working holiday visa i do have to then sacrifice some time with work to be able to try and get either a sponsorship or work towards getting a degree or a trade degree that allows me to be then in the work skilled section because um, at the moment I'm in a job where there's potential to maybe be sponsored or to get into the work skilled area but because I don't have any experience at all I'm kind of starting up from fresh as sort of like a trainee um, yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. Tell people what it is that you did get into work wise. Yes, yeah, so so I came over on a, a four one seven working holiday visa, and basically what that means is I can kind of work any job that I want to or get into any sector that I want to, but it's not classed as a skilled job or skilled visa. That's more for people that have qualifications and degrees that then can go into a job. And it's labelled yeah, skill, skilled work. Engineer, nurse, yeah, engineer, like nurse, teacher. Um, could be bar manager as well. Um, yeah, there's bu- bunch of lists. Um, so I'm on the four one seven. It's the most common one out of them all. Uh, it's majority of what everyone is that comes over. That's the visa that they're on. Yep. Um. So yeah. So I've came over on the four one seven visa, but like I said, I want to kind of stay here permanently. So. 
being on the working holiday visa, I have a maximum of three years. So I have three years uh, on this working holiday visa. And what I looked online is to be on the skilled list, you have to have at least two and a half years experience. So I'm kind of thinking, right, I either work for this company for two and a half years or hopefully I get sponsored and I can kind of get my PR through that instead. But because I'm working with this company at the moment as like a newbie, I'm on like a six month work probation. So I won't know till after six months working with them if one, I'll stay on with them if they want me to stay on and two, if they want to sponsor me. So, so what is the work and, and how much or yeah. so are you getting paid if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, yeah, no problem. So the work in at the, the so the work itself is a audio technician. So I work helping out installing all the PA systems and speaker systems so that you'd see in like the tannoys you'd hear in the train stations or the airports. Um, also work at plant uh, power plants or even private schools, for example. Um, and the pay at the moment, the basic salary is about 60,000 Australian dollars. That's before tax. So I think it's about 30 or 32 dollars an hour um, before tax. Um, and yeah, hopefully if I do end up and I want to stay at this company that I'm with at the moment, I'm sure the salary will go up. I'm not sure how much, but yeah. We just have to wait and see. And then how did you come across this role? Did you Had you done research mm. beforehand that you knew you wanted to get into this type of field or yeah, how did yeah. this come up? So this this is funny. So believe it or not, a magician got me this job. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> he pulled one out the hat, Abracadabra, <laughs> let me tell you. Okay. Yeah, abracadabra got you a job lined up, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so the bar that I was working at back in Spain in the summertime, we used to have a magician on uh, for like the kids and stuff like that. And... He had a friend over here who owned a, this business that I work at. And I told him, oh, I'm looking to move in, uh, move over to Australia. And he was like, oh, cool. Like, I've got a friend over there. Maybe I can get in contact with him. Maybe he can help you out with some leads for work or somewhere to live. I was like, yeah, great. That would be really helpful. And then, long behold, he pulls it out the hat. He goes, I've got in contact with my friend. Um, I've sent him your details if you give him a text and yeah, let me know. So I contacted my boss and he was looking for someone because someone was leaving before the new year. And then that was it by the start of January. So I came here on the 3rd of December. Um, they had taken their work holidays. So they went back to the 8th of January and literally the first day back at work that they were at, I was starting there and then. So Hell it was yeah. all really quick. Yeah, so the the the, the, mu the first month of being in Australia was quite stressful because obviously you've got to get your white cards. You've got to get your driver's license sorted out. You've got to find a place to live as well, more importantly, because <laughs> the last thing you want to do is be dotting around hostels. You know, you don't know what hostel you're going to be in next because so many people coming over to Australia these hostels get booked up so quickly so you could be in a hostel that's 30 minutes away or or, f or longer so yeah just sorting all that stuff out eventually I got it all sorted out luckily which I was quite surprised I was like damn like Australians you know they're they're really good at all the admin stuff you know I thought December near Christmas time everyone be like yeah no sorry mate you're gonna have to wait till mid or January or whatever <laughs> no even till like the last week of December they were like yeah come in, do your driver's license, sort your driver's license out, whatever. Everything was open. I was like, this is great. <laughs> like, it's because the rest of Australia is actually taking holidays during that <laughs> yeah, period. Right, so okay, yeah. <laughs> They're carrying the load of everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Everyone's um, already exodus by that point. Right, so okay, it's just, okay. Respect it's to Western Australia, man. I respect <laughs> that. That's good. I love that. I love that. So uh, that, that month, I guess, where you really were, you'd already basically gotten a job prior to arriving. Like you had something practically yeah. confirmed, right? Mm -hmm. Which is very helpful. So maybe piece of advice, one, go and speak to every single person you could possibly yes, know that definitely. may have a contact yeah. wherever you're going because obviously having a warm lead like that mm -hmm. leads to pretty good outcomes. A hundred percent. Certainly faster. And, and you'd be surprised as well how many people that you know actually either have family members in Australia or know people that are close to them in Australia as well. I couldn't believe it and until I started telling like the customers that we had at my old job or friends or family that was moving to Australia. I couldn't believe how many of those people actually knew people in Australia and how many contacts and they were like, oh yeah, 
like I'll, I'll message this person for you. Um, give me your details. I'll send it over to them. Oh, I've got family over there, or I've got friends, or I know people that have businesses over there. So get in contact with them. I was so surprised with how many people that are in Australia that have connections to the Western world, and it's the easiest, in my opinion. I think that is the easiest way to try and get ahead in your plans is to talk to friends and family and work colleagues tell them that you're going you know let them know what your plans are because you'd be surprised you might get more than what you bargained for as well you know because I think a lot of people as well they kind of hesitate on telling people their plans because they don't want to seem too like full of themselves like, oh I'm going fuck to Australia you. I'm going to Australia yeah, <laughs> fuck you guys you can stay in this depressing country I'm going to sunny Australia you striking some kangaroos you know <laughs> like, I'm taking selfie with quackers what are you doing you losers <laughs> you know so like a lot of I can I can imagine I know I for for sure was one of those people who were quite hesitant to to, to say it to people because I didn't want to come across to yeah you know egotistic or better than someone else you know because from the western point of view Australia is like this paradise country you know it is it in my eyes it is the American day of like the 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 country of dreams now you know because there's so much work so many people amazing so much opportunity you know and so when you're t yeah so just the idea of even going to Australia for the Western world, that's like, wow, that's amazing, man. Like, that's really did big you, step. Did you feel, yeah, like, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to put this. Did you feel like you were betraying people around you for, for leaving or wanting to get out or move to Australia? Like, was there any sort of, like, conflicting emotions? Yes, I kind part? of felt a bit, I don't know, I don't know if this is, like, the right word, but I kind of felt a bit, like, imposter syndrome, <laughs> in a sense, like, because, <laughs> like, not putting myself down or anything, but, like, I kind of work wise and stuff like that, I didn't really have like I don't have much to offer at the moment right so like I was kind of like going to Australia with not knowing anything not a lot of plans so I kind of felt like um, do I deserve this opportunity in okay. a sense I don't know yeah. I don't know why I kind of think like that um so I was kind of like do I deserve this opportunity like I got like friends and that who have got kids and you know would probably love to do and go to Australia, move to Australia, and just can't because maybe financial reasons or maybe just because the ages of the kids or 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 the job position that they're in at the moment they just can't. And then there's me, you know, ready to cut all ties, you know, <laughs> move <laughs> over. Like, See you later, guys. <laughs> yeah, so sorry about you guys, but. <laughs> yeah, it's just like where I lived as well, like I said, because it was for more people that were looking to retire and stuff like that. It was more like a older age demographic. So there wasn't big social groups, you know, going to bars and stuff like that. You're mostly being around people that are 50, 60, not people that are 20s and 30s. So even for me, that was a big change coming here, going into bars and everyone's my age. And I was like, oh, shit, like. I actually have to chat to these people now. <laughs> like, I didn't really have to chat with the older people before because, you know, different eras, you know, different yeah, topics yeah. of conversations. Whereas now it's like, no, you're going to be talking about the same sort of things. Like, you've got to really put yourself out there, which is why I came to Australia as well, was to really build up, you know, a bit of self-confidence and to build up a social life as well. But yeah, some, sometimes before definitely leaving, I was like, damn, like... I don't know if I, I... I didn't even post anything that I was in Australia. Even on, like... You see a lot of people, they post flights, like, going to Australia yeah, or yeah. going here, going there. Or the classic flight ticket. Yeah, to flight <laughs> ticket or just arrived, you know. I didn't do any of that stuff. Like, even after arriving to Australia, even after a week or two, there wasn't anything like, yo, I'm in Australia now. Look at these lovely beaches or whatnot. I was really, like, <laughs> self-judgmental, like... I don't You're an this. arsehole. Yeah. Everyone hates you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people feel that way that are you know, trying to potentially find roots elsewhere as well. It'd be kind of hard not to feel like, yeah, do I? It would yeah. be a bit like imposter syndrome. I think you're yeah. right. Like that feeling seems like it would fit. But I guess for you, did because of where you were brought up did you have a sense for quite some time that i will be moving away from here yeah because you know as you say it was an older populace mm -hmm. it was more for retirees you yeah. probably already knew that maybe this isn't the, sp the space for you yeah. at least for quite a prolonged period of time 
a hundred percent. And the, the so I I got this asked a lot because before moving to Australia, before I had plans to move anywhere, uh, I actually had plans to move back to the UK. So even since I was a teenager and 13, 14 years old, I had always wanted to leave Spain uh, because of that reason, Um, because of the social reason. And um, also I just knew that I wasn't in an area where I could proudly say I lived the Spanish lifestyle, you know. So I always kind of wanted to move out. Um, of Spain in that sense and obviously when I was 13 14 I, it's not like I could move to Barcelona or Madrid because my parents want they weren't going to move there whereas the UK for example I had family over there so at that time I was like if I really did want to move I have family I have my aunties I have my uncles you know I've so I had that potential opportunity when I started to then uh, when I got older and I started working and I started to realise as well, obviously, because of the area, you know, there wasn't much job opportunities. There wasn't much different job sectors because obviously, you know, people are here to retire. They just want to enjoy themselves, grab a drink, yeah. grab some food, go to the beach, you know. So in that aspect, there wasn't a bunch of different job sectors like you have here in Australia. You know, you can work in the mining, you can work in anything really. Like the list is, the list goes on. You can work in like doing what I'm doing now, working in audio technician, or you could be working on a farm, you could be working down at the beach, helping out lifeguards or helping out the surf instructors, whatever it is you can do, you know. So I then got to a point where I was probably about 19, 20, 21, and I was like, wow, if I leave my bar job, I don't really have any other job to go into. Like it's Mm. either another bar or it's a no, or real estate because real estate was really big as well because obviously people are moving to um, retire. So, and I did try to get into real estate, um, and I got a job at real estate. Signed my contract. Three days later, I see Donald Trump on the TV calling an emergency lockdown because of COVID, <laughs> and that was it. Perfect timing. <laughs> Perfect timing. That for me as well. Like when I signed the contract to uh, to work for this uh, real estate job, I was like. Yes, finally, like I'm out the bar game. You know, I'd already been working in the bar game for about five, six years at this point. Already worked about three, four different bars. Um, and I was like, yes, I'm finally out the bar game. You know, this is um, a step in the right direction. And then Donald Trump was on TV, shut that right down for me. <laughs> so no big sales to come through yeah, for the no, next one and a half, two years, whatever it no, was. No, no big sales. Obviously, pandemic here and like yep. here and everywhere else, you know, everyone had to let go of staff to try and keep the business afloat, yep. which is understandable as well. Like, and I can only imagine it must have been a horrible position for employers to be and to have to let go of staff that they've known for a long time because it's the only way to keep the business going you know in a sense and my dad was unfortunate he he was one of those people that had to let people go and it it destroyed him it was it was it it was quite depressing for him as well because like I said he's known a lot of these people for a long time and you've got to remember as well like these people you're you're basically paying for their life you know for them to get food for their family for for their kids clothes and stuff like that like a lot of people don't didn't see that side and you know was kind of like why are you letting all these people go or why did you let me go you know i've got a family and stuff like that and trust me like that's the last thing that they wanted to do you know but it's the only way that they can keep the business afloat and hopefully and and they did some when when covid finally ended they did take on some staff back as well it was more the staff that were like the priority staff you know the the main staff to do the best that you can yeah of course and you have to remember when you come back from covid as well it's not like you're going to have sales straight away you're going to be starting from bottom again almost yeah. as well so and there's plenty of businesses that never reopened oh hun- well, hundreds so. hundreds yeah no one no one uh escaped that super well except for like the, the really big dudes no yeah they did fine but everyone else you know oh if, if anything the really big dudes probably profited more like jeff yeah. bezos Amazon and killed stuff it. like that Sp- they probably had the the most they 100 had the most sales in your, history your big supermarkets killed it yeah your uh your big airlines that got all the the government handouts you know how, pl- how crazy were the supermarkets here during the pandemic uh like were people like 
as if there was a zombie apocalypse, like the, all the shelves were just ransacked. Or yeah, there was. There were periods of that, particularly toilet paper in Australia toilet, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I guess that may have been a worldwide thing. Oh, worldwide, but, yeah. But uh, we, we seemed to kick that off. We had many a news night of uh, talking or going through the shop showing that people were buying stacks of <laughs> yeah, toilet yeah. paper and all this food was going. But pretty quickly, uh, with at least within metropolitan areas, there was probably two to four weeks where it was like bad, mm. and then they were they started to limit things, being you know only one of these per person, yeah, yeah, yeah. and everyone started to chill out a little bit. Mm. It didn't seem to, it wasn't a constant issue, but regional areas they struggled a lot yeah. more because then trucks were still having issues getting to right, okay, places yeah. out there. So I think regional towns suffered even more than metro and metro. Yeah. Struggled for a little bit, but then I think that, you know, basically <laughs> they just put up these signs being like, take one item each, we're <laughs> yeah, gonna yeah. be fine, yeah, yeah. you're gonna get food, yeah. everything, the supply chain is fine for the most part, yeah. it will just take longer, stop trying to store food for you. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, yeah. and they never, everyone. most of the time, they never got through all that food as well. And what's funny oh. as well, the amount of like canned food that was bought and I'm, I'm sure majority of people would never normally buy canned food either. <laughs> and they just, they probably still have the same canned food sitting in the back of their shelves now, picking up dust. We we <laughs> we actually did buy a ton of canned tomato, pasta and beans. Yeah. Like at, at a minimum, yeah. you can subsist off of those yeah, items yeah. and they're not going to expire. Yeah. And that we got into that early, that this was like Feb 2020, yeah. Because a few of us had been following some Twitter accounts. Okay, yeah, And Twitter yeah. was like the early hot pot talking about it. Yeah, yeah. It didn't really hit the shores of the mainstream or legacy yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah, media yeah. you want to call it until probably maybe, I don't know, March, right, okay, april yeah. So we were a bit like, oh, is this a thing? So we yeah, like yeah. started to stock up early. But then we figured that we, we went through this funny cycle of we stocked up for a month and then we saw that it was bad. But then it was like, oh, maybe it's not going to be as bad as we mm. thought. And as it started to develop, it was like, oh, all right, we're actually going to be... We're going to be fine. Yeah. Some people aren't, particularly elderly, particularly people that are a bit prone, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, we went from stockpiling to like when stockpiling became a thing, we're like, you don't need a stockpile. No, well, yeah. We'd already been through that cycle. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just funny how everyone kind of went at a different pace during that period. Do you, think, do you think that people stockpiled a lot because of what they've seen in like movies and like apocalyptic oh, movies, you know, 100%. like... You see the guy and he's got like a doomsday bunker and he's all filled to the top, you know, with everything, all food and you got to imagine like the people that were preppers, that was like one yeah. of the best times of their lives. <laughs> As in they were, you yeah. know, their their work that they'd put into prepping yeah. was paying off dividends at that time. Yeah. They were going like everyone else is stressed, going to the shop. They were chilling, being like, It's happening. Yeah. They've met, you know, particularly if you're in America, like you've got your stockpile of guns, yeah. you've got your farm, you've got your bunker, you've got food for years or whatever you've got sorted. You're sitting back being like, I knew it. Yeah. I I knew it. I saw it coming and I'm ready. <laughs> Do you know? Like yeah, there was, a, there was a group of people that were genuinely <laughs> They just press a button like, underneath I their dining room table and their bunker, like stairs to the bunker just appear. <laughs> and they're just there uh, walking down with their middle finger up like, I fucking told you yeah. guys, you're all going to die up there. <laughs> just smoking on a cigarette before they go down like. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh shit, I got I to walk it. back up. I forgot my bong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've frozen my weed, so it's going to last a long time. <laughs> um, so, Did you ever run out of anything when you were like, not really, like no. toilet roll or stuff like that? No, nah, I don't think so. Because again, we very quickly it, it was sort of uh, only go to the shops once a week, get one person to designate from the household to do it. Yeah. They were trying to put fines and enforce it it was very okay, difficult yeah. to enforce but they were saying mm -hmm. like this is what you should do if you were found to not be following these rules you'd technically be fined a shit load of money like it was yeah, like 50 yeah. grand or something right okay fuck. so no one wanted to take the risk but also it would have been nearly impossible to be caught mm. if you really wanted to just yeah. go to the shops every day you probably could yeah um but I, on the whole i think in there was that stage where everyone was like well that's not really fuck around with this too much you no, know let's yeah, just course. try and be as civil as we can mm. but there was just that period of time where yeah people clearly had seen a few prepping shows like ultimately everyone is looking after you, their own self-interest you got family you got kids you got yeah. old folks you got whoever it may be 
you got you're looking after Nero, you know, because you can't trust the person down the road is going to yeah, do yeah, the same yeah, for course. you. So there is, you know, across the world, you just saw in Australia that I know for certain, everyone was like, all right, how do we look after ourselves, the people we're living with? And, you know, it was yeah. that sort of like flow on effect mm-hmm. until you could all sort of recognise like, all right, we can, everyone is going to be sorted. Yeah. All right, we can relax a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but yeah. there is that original panic of like, we're fucked. Yeah, everyone, yeah. grab, like, let's get a car load. We're going down. Yeah. We're buying up as much as we need and we, like, we're good. Who knows? Does the water shut off? Does no, yeah. You know, there was always those, if, if this is like kills 99% of mm. people or something. Yeah. That's a, like, we're genuinely in the place of you yeah. need it to stockpile or there's going to be, a ghost town mm. in uh, six months' time yeah. or something. You just knew, nobody knew. Well, it was a wild, wild time. When it first started, it did seem like it was. It's the way the media put it. It did seem like it was heading in that direction mm. that it was going to reach at least 90 percent of the population, and it's fatal, you know. And they none of because obviously it was just new. So the the records of people. Uh, receive uh getting covid and then recovering from it was still really low whereas the the numbers of infections were getting into the millions at this point you know and you're seeing then videos on on news outlets and stuff like that of hospitals riddled with people mm. people trying to get into hospitals and they can't because it's too full and whatnot and you're you're looking at that stuff and you're seeing people on ventilators and stuff like that and you're like oh my god if i get it i'm gonna die like there's like it's gonna happen and it's gonna happen to me <laughs> right it was, it was just i like for example like when when it first got announced lo- when lockdown first got announced in spain i remember standing outside the balcony and all i could hear was just this like siren and this like um s- sentences being said off this uh back of a truck and next thing you know it's just a, a truck coming past with a big speaker on the back and it's just broadcasting stay indoors do not leave your house this is an emergency do not leave and that was like this is apocalyptic shit yeah you know like this was full-on like wow there's big speakers going around the whole city now <laughs> you know saying, out of a movie yeah 100 yeah. percent. it was 100 percent like being out of a movie and uh, when we were t- going back talking about um finding people in the shops and stuff like that the police would be at the supermarket doors looking at people's receipts to see if they were getting the essentials because obviously people they were getting a bit frustrated being indoors all the time so they would just pop to the supermarket to get a can of coke or just to get i don't know some biscuits or whatnot and the police started to pick up on it so then they started to look at people's receipts and one lady she went and picked up made a couple of cans of coke some diapers and stuff like that and the police had find her um, and it turns out that she only bought that stuff because it's only what she could afford because she was actually poor and she had like two or three kids. So what happened was the, the police refunded her the money and then bought her two weeks worth of shopping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that's a good news story. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah so it's a good end to that story, but that's just to show how serious they were um, in, uh, in, in Spain. I heard that Australia was quite relaxed in the sense... Like well, you guys only had kind of like six weeks, was it, of proper lockdown? West or? Coast was practically, yeah, none. Like we had a few weeks of lockdown here and there, but for the most part, because we never got really hit by it, yeah. Um, whether that be because we're so we're not as densely populated, mm-hmm. we've got a lot more sun, yeah. You know, we're not as just we're not uh we're just not as mixed together. We seem to just have a little bit more resilience because, again, I think vitamin D was probably playing a big part. Yeah, 100%. But there was a few things, and we were, because we were so isolated largely from much of the world as well, mm-hmm. you know, it took a while for it to sort of get here. And then when it did, yeah, um, yeah we didn't see, we never saw the hospital fill up. We mm. never saw the what had been such an issue in other parts of the world. It just didn't happen. Mm. There were like the occasional deaths and the occasional concerns. I worked in an aged care facility. Oh, okay. And it did make its way through there. And we didn't have any single one of them that got infected. Really? And they were all 80 plus, some with dementia. One dude that really, it was like, he's gone. He's not going to make it through this. It was like the family had come in to sort of say goodbye. 
And then woke up the next day and he was like, fine again. I'm back, bitches. Yeah, it was I'm like, back. it was like- Don't this, cash that wheel in yet. That was, so that, you know, that was, that was- that You was, kids ain't getting any of my money yet, so you better fucking sit down. <laughs> you better make sure you're going back into work tomorrow. <laughs> uh, th- this, this, this particular man, I don't know how many words he could speak at this time, but that, maybe that's what he was thinking. Just like, oh, not yeah. today, yeah, baby. Yeah. I'm, I can't say it, but I'm thinking it. <laughs> So he, yeah, so we kind of like saw it go through and it just wasn't the destructive force yeah. that, you know, we we thought it might be. And mm. again, maybe different strain, like all those different factors that sort of company with it. But it meant that WA, for the most part, it was like, all right, we can largely be open. But they just had a few times where it was like, all right, should we shut down? Da, da, da. And yeah. You know, but it was largely fine. It was really the East Coast, Melbourne, Victoria. Okay. Yeah. That's where they actually had the longest run of lockdown i think in the world oh really they had somewhere i think wow. it ended up being 270 plus days consecutively within lockdown oh my god and then they came out of it for two weeks or three weeks or something and went straight back into it thereafter wow. so we were looking at victoria being like damn like stuff living there and you did yeah, see yeah. directly after there was like a bit of an exodus mm. i think it was somewhere in the order of fifty thousand people just left victoria right, okay, permanently yeah. after that wow. period but it's still considered one of the most livable cities and yeah. states and whatever but um i mean i can understand why they would go back into lockdown because if you've been indoors for 270 plus days you're going to want to go out see your friends you know do a bunch of things you know as well so naturally it's just going to spread again you know and i think with when it comes to i think after being indoors for 270 days you kind of just get to a point where you're like i don't care about the rules anymore oh you just you know, there's just I, no I, way you yeah. want to if you got like given back the ability to go outside do what you want to do and then like two weeks later, like sorry come back in that that would be a very difficult place to be in and not want to be like fuck you yeah of course massively yeah because at that point in time you're probably thinking or at least a lot of people still got it you know like yeah, yeah, yeah. i think the bulk of australians have either experienced COVID or had mm. a version of it yeah. or something and yeah it's not exactly pleasant like no sickness is pleasant but for the bulk that i've spoken with there was just some weird features yeah. to the to the illness but it was nothing of dramatic concern that would make you go all right we should absolutely continue to lock down. And again, maybe you do initially to protect certain groups of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to have a whole population of all ages, kids, everyone, unable to really go out and sort of, you know, explore life long term is also not a good strategy. Mm. So, like, there was a, probably by that time, I can imagine there was a lot of frustration on that side. We were very fortunate not to go through that here or really have a big hit of it through WA. But, mm. yeah, I can... Um, I think we're all glad collectively that we don't talk about it that much. We don't have to think about it. It's largely over with. Yeah, yeah. Thank the Lord because yeah. I, I think we all felt Do you ever think it will come back? Because you still hear sometimes on the radio, on the news, like a new strain of COVID nah. or... COVID, in, in my view, is dead in terms of the concern because yeah. a virus over time as well is less likely to become deadly it starts mm. to mellow out because it doesn't want to kill a host and so it adapts yeah. to avoiding the right, death okay. of a host because otherwise it doesn't it it kills itself it kills out of existence. Itself out, yeah. so okay. viruses are sort of known to adapt in that behavior so as, again that's why with every subsequent strain it seems to probably be less and less of mm. a concern and ultimately like again what are we going to do now with it it's practic. it's just with us we just have to manage it um if someone wants to get shots for it go ahead if yeah. someone just wants to exercise and be healthy go ahead you mm. know like it's like any illness now and virus yeah. people can figure out how to just maintain health mm-hmm. but but i don't think you can if something completely new comes out and it's massive concerns with again deaths or whatever which will inevitably happen given that we yeah. have uh well i think it is just inevitable at some point in time another one will yeah, come I out yeah i mean you look back you look at it all through history you know diseases and stuff like that you know that they're, they're always going to be popping up every couple of hundred of centuries or or whatnot it's just same with war war as well you know like war you look back at history every couple of hundred years there's always some sort of war as well it's just you know that saying like history repeats itself it's just trying to prepare yourself for when those situations do come up and eventually come up um what i do like mm. about it i guess was it was probably the first time i felt that there was 
a global connection that no matter who I spoke with or went or no yeah. matter where I went into the world, there was a shared connection now that we all Okay. We all had that experience of like, are we all done? Mm. I think like the bulk of people yeah. had that moment of w- w- everyone across the world for the most part went let's fucking this, die together yeah, <laughs> yeah. is this it is this it for the humans yeah or for like the bulk of us mm. so um I, th- I always thought that was interesting yeah aspect of it that we there was a global experience that we can all say point to and said yeah i felt what you felt you felt mm. what i felt yeah um and i was like at least I don't know if that's exactly a good thing, yeah. but at least there is that sort of shared connection point. And for you, for yourself, was that um, an impetus at all? Was that something mm. that helped drive your decision to move out of Spain? Or um, so, like, I think when COVID when COVID uh, was happening in Spain, it kind of made me really appreciate more people that work in sectors that normally majority of people wouldn't think as important jobs like working in the grocery stores yeah um obviously nurses everyone knows that nurses and doctors are important jobs but like yeah like working in grocery stores and working in sectors that are priority sectors when you don't realize it and before covid you know you kind of when you're speaking to someone, you meet someone for the first time. It's like, oh, hey, what are you, uh, where are you from? What do you do? And you're kind of like already analysing someone based on what they do work-wise and stuff like that, you know. Um, and it was only during COVID when I realised like, okay, yeah, working in the supermarket, that's not the greatest job, but it's the most important job right now, <laughs> you know, and respect to those people, you know, like, and, and that's really changed my view on yeah just society a little bit as well is it doesn't matter what job you work at really it's not that doesn't define you as a person you know and and it shouldn't in a sense as well like don't criticize or judge someone because of the job that they do as well whether it's you know working at a pig farm or something like that or working in the supermarket you know at the end of the day they're doing the same as you they're working somewhere to earn some money so they can feed themselves and provide for their family you know, and and that's the most important thing. Um, but no, moving to Australia, COVID didn't really have any any sort of um, anything to do with move, me deciding to move to Australia. Yeah. I want to ask you, because so how long have you been wanting to, you know, get the backpacking and the traveller community together in Australia? Um, and was it during COVID and what was that like during COVID? Yeah, so we we sort of kicked this off in about 2019. We'd been thinking about the the problem that backpackers face when it came to trying to find farm work to extend their visa. Yeah, I think it was back in maybe 2017, somewhere like that, that we, myself and about five other mates, we did our own version of a working holiday and moved over to the East Coast for a month, lived out of... It was called a penthouse, but it wasn't really. It was okay. not the glamorous kind of penthouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just called that on Airbnb, but and it happened to have its own little rooftop area. But okay, it was nice. it was like a very eclectic, cool, quirky sort of home. A dude that had like was um, clearly into his art, so it was a very fun place to stay. But we had to work during that time in order to just like you know live and hang around. So yeah. a lot of us just did bar work, hospitality. Um, and during that time, we came into contact with a lot of backpackers who became really good friends. Mm-hmm. They ended up going off to do farm work, which yeah. at that time we'd never knew was a thing. We yeah. didn't know that backpackers had to do that to yeah. extend their visa. So naturally, a lot of questions came about like, what? what are you doing that? What's yeah. the deal with that? Anyway, fast forward, they came back from it and uh, told us all about it and uh, they had been one of them had been stitched up out of like about $1,000 or so. It wasn't mm. paid correctly. Oh, right. Another one had found it very difficult to get into the farm work when staying at a hostel and had to stay at a hostel for like two plus weeks okay. before even getting a job. So it was just like spending, spending money right, okay. on the promise of a job, but it took them a long time there to get no it. There was no guarantee. No guarantee that they thought there was. Yeah. And then once they got there as well, they also felt like there was no option to really leave because mm-hmm. you were already spending this money. You didn't necessarily have the way to get out of there. So, yeah, the whole thing, there, it was just riddled with issues. And during that time, um, I was also just doing some basic travel, just been to Sri Lanka for a month. So we were sort of into the backpacker scene and the yeah. vibe. 
And two of my mates are engineers by trade, mm. so they were thinking about the problem. And, of course, Uber at this time exists, Airbnb exists. Yeah. There's all these technological solutions for being able to find these you know, basic things around you, your transport, yeah. your accommodation. So why wasn't there something like that for these jobs? Mm. Why wasn't there some visibility, some easy way to connect up the farms and the farms, backpackers? Yeah. So it sort of naturally started off from those two guys just thinking like, how could we solve this problem? Yeah. Um, and you just call like a bunch of farmers. Like, hey. <laughs> there was a lot of that. Yeah, so I can imagine. Because I, I, I didn't join it for about a year. I started working actually in a startup for a cryptocurrency group because I was really big into Bitcoin and okay. interested in that space. Um, and then I was doing like community and marketing management there, something I'd never done before. And I was just trying to learn mm. as an intern. Like I was like, don't pay me. I'm just going to like figure out what okay, I'm yeah. doing here. And then my mates were like, actually, we kind of need that as well. Right, so okay, I, yeah. I naturally sort of jumped across. I was like, hell yeah, I want to work yeah, with yeah. my mates on a project. That would be really cool. Um, and it really did have to start off with how do we get in contact with farmers Okay, well, we're not farmers, so that's going to be quite a difficult thing. Mm. So you just ended up having to do a lot of cold calls, being like, hey, what do you think about a service that would allow you to connect with people for free and allowing you to get pickers, packers, whoever you need, yeah. whenever you need them? And there's, you know, like anyone, no one wants to receive a cold call. Yeah, So, yeah. Th- you know, there was every time it was like, all right, how do we get people on? There was always like problems that came up with it. And it was difficult, but we launched the original platform in 2020. So we were sort of trying to build it up over 2019. The guys built it because we built everything in-house. They learned to code and everything, which was great. Okay, cool. And then, uh, yeah, we launched it. And then just as we were getting moving, yeah, COVID hit. And we were like, oh, <laughs> oh. Shit. But uh, we settled, with it. we were actually all living in the same share house as well mm. at this time. Um, oh, well, one of them wasn't, but we kind of sat on it for a little bit for like a week we were still working and we're like do we give this up do we keep yeah. going the whole world's going into this lockdown pandemic like is this mm. is this where we sort we of got no stop? backpackers <laughs> we got no backpackers coming in borders are shut down like yeah. people can't move around necessarily out into regional areas yeah, should we just call it a day and then we sort of opted on the side of yeah but everyone's experiencing this mm. There's no, there is no business or company that doesn't isn't currently having to go through yeah, the same yeah, problems. Yeah. Yes, it's cutting off the people that we're meant to be servicing, and mm. yes, people can't necessarily move out into farms. But ultimately, when we can again, because we inevitably yeah. have to, do we want to have continued to have worked so that we're ready, and you know yeah. we can hopefully be a really good solution at that time. So, um, it, it turned out to be, and it's maybe a little bit long winded, but it turned out to be a blessing because mm. for the first time when we were talking to farmers, they really were desperate for people. Right, okay. Whereas previously, there were old systems in place. You know, you'd mm. go into Facebook groups, you'd go into Gumtree, people would just naturally drive through your regional town knowing that they're trying to find farm out to extend their visa. Right, okay. So there was just like a, a natural way that farmers got people, didn't have to think about it too, too much. Right, okay. And now they were turning around going, we don't have any backpackers. Yeah. How do we scrape up as many people as possible? So our solution or our platform at the time was at least like, we'll try anything. Boom, we'll, yeah. we'll jump on. So there was a demand all of a sudden. So look, it was it was like good from that side. But um, I think as I spoke to you the other day about mm. it, we just honestly, we couldn't monetize the the jobs platform. It was always, it was just hard. We weren't farmers. We could understand the backpackers, but we really did find and ultimately just struggled uh, on the grower side yeah. to get enough people on and, and to get that that side of it working um but all the while we had some groups and we were always talking about packers i'm talking like on the phone calling speaking mm. to them and the same sort of thing did arise which was you know people would just arrive in they're always looking for work to complete their 88 days and they're looking for people to go and meet up with yeah ultimately was sort mm. of the major two things so we you know originally we'd been with jobs and we were like well we we really can't we, we've we struggled here on the job side we're gonna have to call it a day but we did have at least one other problem that constantly arose it was like how do we, we meet with other people mm. um and funnily enough again covid did make it more difficult because hostels a lot of hostels actually closed down businesses yeah, right, okay yeah simply didn't survive during that period so now when everything did reopen some of those hostels were no longer around to mm. help take in the influx yeah so now more people are having to move to apartments and find airbnbs so again 
a little bit more cut off from where you might be from other people and other travelers yeah so the same issue began to rise we're like all right well can we do one last give it another shot do the classic pivot yeah um and we're like well whilst we're figuring out the tech side let's just see um, whether or not we can meet the need locally like can we get um, is there a real desire? People say there is, but behaviour is a whole other different thing. Mm. And as soon as we put up the first event, which was back in, I don't know, 2022, very not too long after we opened, was it 2021, 2022, whatever it was, was just down to a bar to meet up with a few people and it was like 15, yeah. 20 people arrived. Right, from okay. So very quick, it was like, oh, there is actually, again, a big desire yeah. and need for... There pe- are people and there are people that want to meet up together. Yeah, and then yeah. just simply don't have the same means because, again, you just might not be able to in a hostel at that time. Yeah. Uh, and that's, we kept getting that feedback was, man, I really appreciate this because I would be living by myself or in a share house with people that right, okay. don't necessarily speak my language yeah. or whatever. So I'm finding it really difficult to, to meet up with people. Right. And so, again, there was like, all oh, right, cool. There, there, there is something mm. here. And um, so that's really where the... The, the, the desire, I guess, of like, all right, there is a problem here we can help with. And me personally, I'm the opposite to my co-founder. Okay. So I'm fairly comfortable in a group of strangers. Yeah. I can go around, introduce, start any conversation. Like, this is why I love travel because mm. I can go anywhere and I feel very comfortable that I'll find people that I can vibe with. And all of a sudden, like, your adventure is like, it feels like a real adventure. Yeah. Like, there is a true... There's a true freedom and authenticity to yourself and the people that you're around yeah. when you're doing this. Whilst my co-founder, he really struggles. Right, okay. So he finds it very difficult to just chat to a random, yeah. strike up a conversation. And so, like, we had this natural... We're really solving the problem for him. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm kind okay. of able to facilitate, I guess, that group experience. Yeah. So, like anything, I highly recommend that if you're ever going to take on any venture... Mm having a, a partner that's practically the opposite to you yeah. is very, very helpful. Um, 100%. And is, is 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 your business partner, is he a bit better now with, with strangers or? Yeah, like he's not, I wouldn't say that he's like really bad or mm. anything. It's just, it's not his natural tendency yeah. to, and uh, in fact, for both co-founders uh, at the time, neither of them are very, very comfortable with, just new people yeah 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 um but like anyone once mm. you st- you only not everyone's like that and that's fine but you'll find that most people as soon as they get a bit comfortable you know you, then you they start to come yeah, out of their of shell and, and yeah. that's like the natural way and for them they probably gravitate towards someone that's able to help mm. do that yeah. right whilst i actually funnily enough tend to gravitate towards the the more quiet people yeah yeah and that's it, why i'm here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well, I feel like I'm anyone at. listening to this show so far <laughs> won't think, "Oh, Jordan, he seems like a quiet guy that's yeah. not very really comfortable chatting with random." This, this is the th- this is like one of the th- things that I was most excited for coming on here was to really get myself out of the comfort zone because I probably relate a lot to your two co-founder buddies because I'm very much the same uh, when it comes to strangers. I just don't have it in me to just randomly go up to him and start speaking. But for if for whatever reason we do end up start speaking, I'm then super comfortable and just that whole pressure or speak going up speaking to a stranger is just gone. Yeah. Um funny enough, before before we met the other day at the beach, me and a friend of mine, we we joked around and said, Let's play a game of we have to pick a stranger and go up and talk to him <laughs> because <laughs> we're, we're both just sitting on the beach, like not not trying to make conversations with anyone else. Just be, I, I don't know. Just for me, I'm just I get so uncomfortable. Um, the idea of going up to a stranger and be like, hey, hey, like the worst thing they can say is go away or no, right? And then that's <laughs> which they never say. <laughs> which they never, yeah, which they never say. Like, like pick a bar down in uh, city center. Like, uh, went down there a couple of weeks ago with some friends, and. Me and two of my mates, we're just sat there on the wall. There's heaps of people around us. And in my head, I'm just like, just go over to people and speak. Like, there's hundreds of people here, Jordan. (laughs) Go over and speak to them. And it was like one of those things like, 
oh, my mind's saying yes, but my body's saying no. <laughs> uh, so have you figured out, you know, um, have you figured out any games, tricks, ways to sort of try and prompt you to do it? Um, no. Have you got any tips? Because you seem to be like very outgoing person. So the re- from my end, yeah, yeah. the way that Give I... Give them to me, please. <laughs> the way that I... I tend to do it is I seemingly go in because I don't normally think about it a whole lot. It just, I just, nah, I just tend to do it, but I'll either, I'll either go up with like a question about advice. Okay. Because it's a very, uh, it's a very easy thing for someone to respond to if you're going in for advice, like, mm-hmm. Hey, um, blah, blah, blah. I'm just looking, do you know any like really good bars around here? Yeah. Like it's a question that you can answer and it's a little bit open and can lead down the thing. Oh, there is. Yeah, cool. Like, uh, da, 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 like you can just sort of follow up with natural questions yeah. after that, or you can start to explain a little bit about your story. Oh, like, I haven't actually been around here a whole lot before. Mm. I'm like, do you know the area that well? Like, yeah. you know, there's just ways that you just, a question that about a, gen- and not like a fake question where you're just, no, you know, like a genuine. You actually would like to know something um, that you feel like the person might be able to help with, and if they mm. don't, again, it's really just that first point of contact, as you say. Once you get past the initial hello yeah. question, first word, honestly, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. typically going to start to find that like you're fine, or if the person's, you know, not clearly not vibing as well, and you can pick that up. That's also totally fine, mm. and you can be like, look, really appreciate the answer. Like, thanks so much, Harry. By the way, like, yeah. hopefully, can see you around, and then you know, you'll find out very quickly whether they're vibing or not, and it's not a big deal if they were to back away. So, one going up for advice and not expecting a lengthy or anything to happen is okay. like a very easy. You can't be, you can't lose or be rejected mm. when your expectation is set at answering a question. Yeah, because the person will either know the answer or be able to say, I'm really sorry, I don't know. Yeah, you've no got, problems at all. You've got your information and it's an easy exit. Yeah. But yeah. if it feels like there's a natural, continuous like conversation that's going on, like great. You mm. just sort of like lean into that. But um, you're not trying to go for a specific outcome, I find is like pretty helpful. Yeah. Um, and then also for me, again, either the if you're in that group situation, I like the – you find a little inside joke that you can make against yourself or against okay. someone else. Um, and I don't exactly know how to explain that one necessarily, so I'm not sure that I can consider it great advice. But uh, there's always something about taking like a, a cheap jab at, at yourself, yourself yeah. but, but also somehow that it includes like the person around you. Or the situation or something. Yeah, yeah. that like, you know, just a really easy laugh, even if it's a shitty Yeah, like this fucking place style. sucks, don't it? Like something like yeah. that or... Exactly, like know. the weather's like really hot and you're like, it's a bit cold here, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. it's just a very basic thing that someone can be like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, like yeah. sort of thing. Those ones I find are just the easiest because you, you'll know if someone also wants to engage... They'll give you something back. Mm. They'll search to give you something back. If they don't, it's like, all right, no, yeah. no harm, no foul. You know, it's all fine. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. If you and your mate continue to challenge yourselves yeah. to go up and talk to the stranger, naturally it is a bit of a skill and it's just removing a bit of that fear um, and you'll just you will become significantly mm. better at it. But don't you find, you know, again, you're you're travelling technically, you yeah. know, even though you're you know, staying, staying in Perth here, and yeah, working. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't know anyone here, do you find it easier to approach and chat with people here than you would have back in Spain or do you uh, find it harder here? Yeah, so it's it's definitely easier even though like it, it, it's definitely easier in the sense of there's more opportunity to make friends, right? Because there's a lot more people now my age, There's which means there's a lot more things to do like the volleyball or casual football or... Um, yeah anything you got a bunch of concerts basketball games all sorts so in that sense yeah there's definitely a lot lot more opportunity in me and and making friends it's just it's something I just have to work on personally to really just get myself out there more and hopefully who knows in the future I will be not a completely different person but I'll definitely be a lot more confident in in that sort of sense so social wise um and I, I was never always like that Gro- like growing up as a as a teenager like I was very outgoing with friends and stuff like that and I think it probably was just getting older you know and then naturally you drift away from your friends you know they start having kids or they move away or whatnot and stuff like that 
and then you work in a lot and then you're like oh, I'm not really social in that socializing that much anymore and obviously if you're not doing that for a long period of time it's going to somewhat affect you in in some sort of way um and I think obviously then being having a lockdown on top of that you you know yeah. for a year or two years depending on where you was um but have you always been outgoing yourself uh it's a good question I think so what well no not actually really through I used school. to be an emo in school <laughs> it, it, I was always uh, I was a floater in school I didn't really have a strong friend group through high school um so okay. I think I was always relatively good at all things mm. so I wasn't exactly the, I wasn't being picked on or anything yeah but I naturally had a lot of interests um, and just never really created like a core group of people. Okay. So I probably felt like, I don't know, I don't know if you'd say lost or like I certainly wasn't out so... Of, out of place? No. Maybe a little bit, but mm. I certainly wasn't so outgoing that I was like considered myself popular or okay. could go up to any group and... Just keeping your head low. Whatever. Relatively head low. Mm. Um, so then coming out of uni, I... I mean, out of uni, out of school, um, I I think I got a, a bit fortunate in that I did end up picking up like one or two really good core mates just towards yeah. the end of school time. But then my interests moved into like how to be like, what is life all about, right? And, yeah. and, and sort of it ended up doing things like making me go like, all right, how do I be really healthy and, and strong because I think that's really important to yeah. maintain that. All right, how do I really get my mind healthy and strong mm. because I think that's really important. And for me, I ended up having um, an experience doing a Vipassana meditation camp, oh. which is the 10 day silent. Have you yeah, done? No, I really want to do it. I, it's, I saw that they have a center in Western Australia do, yeah. and one of the dates well, that they had on because they don't have it on like every week. It's it's like s seasonal. I don't know yeah. what, period wise, but the last one that they had for the year was literally a week before I arrived to Australia, and I was so gutted because <laughs> like I I I suffer with a bit of like anxiety and like OCD and stuff like that. So I was I obviously looking up like how things to, to help with anxiety you know on youtube and meditation came up a lot then i found mm. out about vipassana and it's like one of the best m forms of meditation and then i saw that they had a retreat over here and i was like oh great and then i looked on the dates and i was like oh, i've just missed it but it's definitely something i'm gonna do did you finish the whole 10 day yeah i've done a few now so oh you've done a few yeah, yeah oh man that's hardcore because i've i've heard stories of people after three four days you know it's just too much meditation it's too much the, the, their yeah. own mind literally <laughs> kicks them out the center uh, i i do i kind of liken it to it, it is it is really a skill acquisition mm. so if you're throwing a ball against the wall and you've never done that beforehand you're barely gonna be able to throw it you're barely gonna be able to catch it but you keep doing it keep doing it eventually you'll be able to throw and catch that ball without thinking and you can just do it yeah. and start to have a lot of fun with it mm. but if you really don't put in the effort to begin with in order to learn like how it is that i'm throwing and using my hand and if you're really not working on the skill itself and you're sitting there just looking at this wall and and being like well i don't know about this that's yeah. where i find people are likely to leave mm. because it's the whole way through and it's a 10 day silent retreat you're not supposed to look people in the face it's designed to make you really try and focus in on developing the skill that they're teaching you yeah and it does change like it, it gives you new information to work on so it's mm. not exactly the same thing day in day out but there are, you know, it's, what is it, 10 hours a day of yeah. meditation, basically, or something to that effect. And it is a lot, and it's a lot of sitting, and mm. it's difficult at times. But if you're really, really throwing in your attention and your focus onto developing the skill mm. and trying to do what they're telling you to do, yeah, you that's the only way to to really get what, get out of it what you're there for yeah yeah um if you're there sort of half-heartedly being like eh, mm. trying a bit here but kind of like preferring to not really think yeah. about it or not if you're not really throwing yourself into it that's where you do see people go i just can't 
it can't because you can't just sit somewhere and do nothing for yeah. 10 hours a day you will literally go insane yeah, and not yeah, want to yeah. be there anymore yeah. but as long as you're really throwing yourself into it i think yeah. that's where it's it's just harder than what you would imagine probably oh, I, I but mean, um but I, but everyone is totally capable of it it's like mm. if you've ever gotten into an ice bath and you have to do it for three minutes. Yeah. The first 30 seconds, it's like, I can't do it. There's no way. Oh, I literally can't do this. Your fingertips are so, like, hurting so bad. Yeah. Like, you if can't breathe guy, properly. Your PP hurts a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like it's your brain is yelling at you yeah. saying, you're not staying here. Yeah, yeah. No, like, you thought you could do yeah. this. All right, Wim Hof, get the fuck out the yeah. tub. <laughs> All right, you're not Wim Hof. All right, get the fuck out the tub. <laughs> and and that's, that, that's a very condensed version of, well, I guess, what happens mm. for people that leave things like the Vipassana. It's just your brain is shouting at you saying, you can't do this. Yeah. yeah. But, like, the, the ice bath, once you're really just focusing on your breath and you let that 30 seconds pass, that mm. initial panic pass, yeah. you know, you can you can do it and yeah. it is possible as much as for a brief moment in time, it, you don't you don't think it's possible. Mm. And it's very funny how that sort of stuff works. But that's, for me, you know, doing those things early on, and I said this to people as soon as I left, that to me was a greater learning experience than all my years of school. There was a, wow. it was a greater insight into me and the world around me and yeah. how I can move through it. And for me, that, I think, really did give me like a lot of confidence in being comfortable with like who I am and being yeah. comfortable uh, in silence, mm. ultimately. And I really do appreciate and like the quote of, you know, the world would be a better place if more people were able to sit in a room silently. Yeah. Um, and I think that's totally true, and at least with the Vipassana, it forces you to address that. And so in any given situation, I don't necessarily feel like I have to feel the silence. Mm. Um, I can, I, I don't know, it just, it did make me, I think, feel more comfortable to be authentic. Yeah. Um, and so given that, it makes it a lot easier to be mm. outgoing in a group situation. Yeah. Um, and maybe one other thing on top of that is just, you know, if you're looking after yourself you're always going to feel better about yeah. being outgoing. If you're looking after your mind, you're obviously going to feel better about being yeah. outgoing. And if you're trying to develop like understanding and skills and you're passionate about things or just you're staying curious with things, mm. so you're letting your mind like develop, learn and grow, it allows you to talk to someone about just about anything. Yeah. Right? And so if you're doing those things and you're growing and you're learning and, and you're becoming comfortable with yourself, it's hard to find people that you couldn't, learn from have yeah. a good conversation with and it's a very i guess it i don't know if you feel the same way mm. but i feel like from i could practically go to anyone and probably have a conversation as long as there isn't a communication barrier yeah i mean i i, I think you could, i literally think you could go up to the pope and speak to him no problem at all <laughs> you know like <laughs> you, oh, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah it would probably give you a white robe as well <laughs> He's like, you can, yeah, you'll you can be, leave from you'll here, You'll be brother. Vice Pope. <laughs> yeah. you'll, you'll be my next successor. Vice Pope, and that is VP too. That's yeah. VP as well. How sick would that be? Vice Pope. That sounds better than being the Pope. Dude, I'm Vice, Vice Pope, Pope it, that sounds like the OG role. Like you get yeah. to go around all the glitz and glam, none of the actual yeah, issues. Yeah. Like You don't really have to speak beha on behalf of God. You just get to like represent yeah yeah be, like vp even a rapper name vice pope vice pope vice pope's, pope's actually a sick rapper name you yeah, know yeah, yeah yeah i'm claiming that yeah. by anyway anyone listening that's mine okay <laughs> i will sue your ass <laughs> vice pope coming soon um, and with vice pope as well technically you can do big v little i big p vip <laughs> um, uh, no but going back to v pasana um like you said with the silence, you know, for me at the moment, I I hate silence, man. Like silence, if I'm if I'm with a group of people and there's silence, I hate it. I feel like th I always have to fill in the silence, or someone has to fill in the silence because I just naturally feel so uncomfortable when yeah. there's some silence. When even at the moment um, with like work colleagues and stuff like that, because I've I've only just started this new job, so I don't really know them that well, you know, and or maybe they're not doing that much, and I'm not doing that much, just working most of the time. So naturally, there isn't much to talk about during work. So there's sometimes a lot of silence, and it eats me up alive, man. It does, it yeah. really does. And I guess doing the vipassana, I can imagine that you have to accept the silence. You've got no choice because if you don't, you will go crazy. 
you know and when you're sitting there in silence like if a- anyone listening if you've never meditate before just even try do it for a minute two minutes and you'll notice how difficult it is it's it really is a skill like meditation is a skill and it is something that you have to practice on a lot and consistently because you can do it for a little while but then if you take a break from it and you try to get back into it you're almost starting to square one again you know and oh uh, yeah 100 percent. yeah like it, uh, it really is like the the gym you know people will will always say, I can't I can't meditate. My mm. mind's too active, mind's too active. It's like, yeah, if you'd never lifted weights beforehand, are you expecting to go into the gym and be like, Oh, I can't yeah. lift weights, I can't of course you can't. You've never done it before. No, yeah. yeah how yeah, long yeah. it take it take you at least two weeks just to develop the coordination from your brain to your muscles to be like, Oh, this is how we do it. Yeah, like exactly. it takes repetition, 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 mm. repetition, repetition. Yo, yo I was about the VP. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. But the repetition is the same with the meditation for mm. sure and if i stop going to the gym for a long period of time i'm going to decondition yeah and i will be starting kind of from square one i'll have maybe a bit of a faster acceleration process yeah. but the same thing is true with the meditation and it really is just getting comfortable with the fact that you know it, it's harder to see that muscle changing mm. and particularly early on there's a lot of frustration around it that's the that's the normal side and it's just the fact that you're not looking at the end result you're looking at just every repetition that you're doing that success the mm. fact that you're there doing the repetition that is progress yeah exactly not the actual outcome not the whatever state of mind you think you're trying to achieve it's just the fact that you're doing it mm. doing the repetition that's your progress um, yeah. and, and that's hopefully it tr- makes it a little bit easier for anyone trying to do it um, because yeah I think that definitely gets in the way of, of, of people particularly if you've never read into it you know everyone's got sort of an idea of meditation and it's most likely that your idea is wrong yeah Yeah. oh like when i I remember when i first started meditating because you i never really understood the concept of uh you are not your thoughts right i I never really understood that concept uh until i started meditating and it was only when I started sitting there in silence and... Keep going, I'm just going to put on the I'll, light. Yeah, yeah. And I was sitting there in silence and I'll, all these thoughts then just kept coming up in my mind, all these random thoughts or whatever. And the key to meditation is to really be able to distance yourself from those thoughts and to become basically detached from those thoughts and to recognize them that they are just thoughts. Same with uh, emotions as well. And it was when I started meditating, I was like wow, like the mind really does feed you a lot of crap, you know, and <laughs> it, it, and even though your thoughts sound like you, you know, and and they give you feelings as well, it's like, that's not actually you. <laughs> like, it's just the state that your mind is in and you can change that state. And it's meditating is the number way to be able to become aware, so especially building up awareness towards your thoughts and emotions. And that's why I think it helped me a lot when I was going through an, an anxiety period or whatever to sit back and go, oh, okay, I, I'm I'm anxious or I'm having these anxious thoughts, but that's okay. Whereas before it would be, oh, I'm feeling anxious, I'm having these anxious thoughts, everything's going wrong, all these, and then I'm getting all these thoughts and I'm sucked into them like yeah. a vacuum, you know, whereas now I'm like, I can distance myself from it, you know, and okay, yeah, I might still feel anxious, but I don't have that feeling that, my world's going to end, <laughs> in a sense. You not know? as attached to... Yeah, exactly. I'm not as attached. And that it, that's why, when I said before, it was the greatest learning experience that I've had is doing that course, is because it really felt like you learned something true about the world that was not obvious, mm-hmm. right? Like, okay. you can learn things about, you know, history, and I'm sure maybe mathematics and physics probably has a similar uh, sense, but this was something that you really could only derive from your own personal experience of really working on this particular thing, and it was the equivalent of a significant or big acid or shroom trip where it felt like it gave an insight into some layer of the world that you just didn't appreciate beforehand yeah. and you you take that piece with you, you don't have to think about it from then on. Mm. I don't have to think consistently like, oh, are these thoughts my thoughts and, you know, I'm angry, oh, I'm angry or I'm sad or I'm sad. Um, like for me, you learn something about the nature of your emotions and your thoughts yeah. which allows you to be 
just sort of like calm for lack of a better word yeah, in yeah. more situations or recover a lot faster mm. um, because you're not so like I don't know about you I've got a dad who is prone to anger at times okay and, and particularly on the golf course okay nice and, nice nice and it will literally ruin his day yeah to have a bad game on mm. the the golf or even during the game if he's playing with myself and my brother yeah. which for all intents and purposes is his ideal day yeah yeah just yeah, to hang out with his boys yeah. and play some golf but if he starts playing bad he literally turns it into the worst day for himself well, okay. he is so attached and yeah. believes that well he feels frustrated and sad and angry and whatever and so therefore he has to live in that world mm. and he'll do it for the whole day all oh, right okay. beat himself up and be like oh fucking terrible yeah. shot you know all those things that's not actually the reality you need to live in. And you, mm. you figure that out, at least in, in my end. Someone can say, oh, you don't need to think that way or you don't need to, you know, you could just forget about it, just be happy or whatever. Yeah, You can say that to someone, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it just annoy him more, That's if anything. That's 100% annoy him more. And Which I enough. kind of understand yeah. as well. Let him go process that, you know. Don't try and just... Don't try and yeah. take yeah, him yeah, out. You're not try. I don't recommend you say that to people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like someone's having a really shit day and it's like, mate, come on. It's yeah. fine. Look, it's a lovely day yeah. and it's like, you're the last person. Or Shut the, the fuck la- up. Yeah, that's the last thing I want to hear right <laughs> yeah. now. My cat's just died. Okay. <laughs> Snoozy's dead. <laughs> Snoozy. <laughs> He's snoozing forever. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely don't recommend that advice. But it, it is funny how... I've at least experienced that I'm aware that that emotional state mm. can at least be somewhat altered or it doesn't have to be a reality. And when you sort of recognize that that doesn't have to be a reality, you, I don't know, you take that with you and it sort of just makes you get over things quickly because yeah. why would you decide in some mm. sense to live there given that you've experienced something that allows you to appreciate a detachment of like, oh, like there's a feeling going on and thoughts are um, arriving or arising from that feeling yeah. and like that can be a cyclical thing mm. but ultimately like there are ways to that later change the nature of what's going on and yeah. you, you kind of step back and go like oh that doesn't have to be mm. a feature in my life right yeah. now like I, it can just be a background thing or I can let, let it hit me and appreciate mm. it and allow it to move on and cool I'm just back to just living my yeah. life now rather than spending seven hours depressed oh. sad and angry about the fact that I had a shocking golf game yeah. with my boys or well, it's like it's like as well when when you've had an argument with someone or you know something uh, memories came up and it was something that pissed you off in the in the past and and next thing you know you know you're just fixated on that or what the person said to you and then you're then you're having fake conversations in your mind with what you should have said or, or you're replaying what happened and you're just spending your whole time getting yourself in this angry frustrated state and the other person that you've been thinking about isn't even next to you or with you they're yeah. probably at home or cross country doing their gardening or something. <laughs> they're not even they think- thought twice. Yeah, yeah, they're not even thinking about you and you're just sitting there getting angry, stressed out for no reason, you yeah. know? And that's just that's just how strong the mind is in a sense of, or yeah, just how strong the mind is in a sense of how it can really take over your awareness so yeah. easily and you don't even know it. You think that's just you being you and it's like, no, like your mind is literally doing that to you and you need to build some awareness to, like you said, so that you can then recover from it as quickly as possible because yes, you, you're, you're still going to have those thoughts and, and those feelings. They're going to come up. You can't stop them from coming up, but it's how you then react to them, you know, how quickly you can recover for them, from them. And um, like, that's something that I could definitely, I, 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 like after this podcast I'm definitely going to meditate more now <laughs> for sure because I used to med- I used to meditate a lot especially a couple of years ago um, I used to meditate a lot I used to meditate maybe once waking up then once before going to bed for about an hour each time um, depending on how tired I was because sometimes I'd meditate before going to sleep and I'd actually fall asleep <laughs> so, so how would you do it? yeah so no, so I'd wake up the thing is, because uh, I wouldn't, so some people would say like the best way to do like Vipassana is when, as soon as you wake up to do it. But I always ended up trying falling asleep and I would actually whack my head off against the wall because my head was going back. <laughs> so I kind of waited maybe an hour or two, then I'll do maybe a half an hour or an hour Vipassana. Then I'd go up about my day and then I'd come back home and then 
normally before going to bed, before I'm getting tired, I'd do another hour then of Vipassana. Um, and I'd always feel so great afterwards. So is I it, and when you say Vipassana, are you saying that you're following just breath or what sort of the Yes, actual so f- uh, following just breath, yeah. So just really focusing on uh, nasal breathing, just in and out through the nose. Um, and then just, yeah, just focusing and being aware from on the thoughts and the feelings that I'm getting throughout my body. Um, maybe some tingling or... Or just yeah, temp- temperatures a lot as well. I, th- I think you'd probably experience it. Like when you're meditating, you feel like you're getting colder. Or at least for me, I felt like my body temperature was getting colder. So that's a, that. W- <coughs> sorry, that for me uh, was a sign that I was getting deep into the meditation because I could feel myself getting colder. Mm-hmm. Um, it's which at the start I thought it was just a me thing. Then I looked up and I was like, oh no, it's quite normal. People tend to feel colder when they're meditating. Um, it's funny how what happens is, again, it's like anything, it, it's a very different experience as you're trying to learn a skill. And this one in particular has a very interesting characteristic and it's different for everyone. And uh, one of the things about Vipassana as well is they sort of recommend not to go too deep into like the technique of it for someone that's never done it before mm. um, because it's very likely that what I say about how the Vipassana works will have errors yeah. collecting throughout whatever it is I'm describing, mm. which can inform someone maybe in a slightly incorrect way right. or it can put ideas in someone's head about what mm. they can expect and then it can sort of um, become a little bit of a blocker almost to developing yeah, yeah. the skill. But uh, I found even even yesterday, and let me know what you think or how often this happens to you, but I find... We very we, we do very rarely actually live, uh, you know, it's the classic live in the present, but we yeah. very rarely actually live in the present. And one way I can note or mark this is I was doing uh, jiu-jitsu the other day mm. and the teacher is going through a particular technique and I'm watching, I'm looking, I'm watching, I'm looking, and he's speaking, he's going through it. And for 15 seconds, I'm not there. Yeah. Because I was thinking about something else from the day before mm-hmm. um, and I'm watching and I th- I'm i actually believing that I'm paying attention yeah. <laughs> until there's some weird point in time where I go like, what have they just gone through? Mm. And I can't pass back to figure out what this person's just yeah. been showing me. And I'm like, pay attention. Mm. And it's like, I'm looking, I'm listening, but my attention was elsewhere. Yeah. And that's what the, the, the practice of meditation is really – is the ability to really focus your attention on what you want to focus on, yeah. which will ideally keep you in the present. Mm. Um, and I, I, that's just, uh, I, I don't know, but for you, do you, you're at work, do yeah. you have those moments or is that sort of like a... I have too many of those <laughs> moments, <laughs> yeah. uh, let me tell you. So so for me, with meditating, I get into a bad habit of, I'll go through a period of meditating and I feel really good and there'll be periods of times where I feel very, very present. And then what happens is, it's because I'm going through these moments where I'm feeling very, very present like throughout days or weeks or whatever. I then feel like or think, oh, I don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> oh, 100%. Yeah. So what happens is then I won't then meditate for months um, on end until then my mental state is bad and I'm like, okay, I'll get back into meditating. So my my bad habit is not sticking to good habits. That That is my bad habit. Um, same with anything, the gym. I've, I've got a gym membership <laughs> and I haven't been to the gym in the past <laughs> month, <laughs> you know? Like, and I keep telling myself that I should quit the gym and only because... Um, so I, I start work early and then by the time I finish work, I'm a bit tired, but I like to play golf a lot. My dream job is to become a golf coach. So I'm when I finish work, I'm heading straight to the golf course. Um, by the time I leave, then it's about six, six, seven, still got to cook dinner. And then I sleep early because obviously I'm waking up early for work. So it might be an excuse. I don't know. But I, I just feel like I don't have a lot of time to go to the gym. So the, the saying it out loud just sounds like such an <laughs> excuse. It does, but input. But when it's happening, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but um, that is the funniest thing to so do when you do say your intrusive. Th- well, not your yeah. intrusive, but your internal thoughts out loud about why you don't do something. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You will always, almost always, sound like a pussy. Oh, a hundred percent. Like because <laughs> I'm saying it out loud, and I'm like, 
you can split it up in days. You don't have to go every day, you fucking idiot. Like, you can go on the weekends <laughs> when you're not working, you know. Does that really justify it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, yeah, but you can get more golfing though. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. it's just, yeah. But going back to attention span, um, it's something that I struggle with a lot. Like you mentioned, when someone's speaking, you know, and you're there, your body's there, but your mind's somewhere else. And I don't know, so... I kind of, I, I struggle with OCD, so I struggle a lot with like intrusive thoughts and ruminating. And the problem with that is even if I'm at work doing stuff, my mind is obsessively fixated on s- a something else, a theme, a topic, whether it would be, a, it, it doesn't matter it's about anything. It could be about work. It could be about something that I saw on TV. Mm-hmm. And the problem with OCD is it become it's, it's a subconscious habit. So what happens is, is that I'm repeatedly obsessing, having these obsessive thoughts, but I don't have any control over them. So even though I can, I, I could go, okay, like there's no need to think about that. I'm just going to focus on work or whatever. I can still be doing the work, but my mind is still consess- con- consistently th- uh, thinking about these thoughts. Um, so meditate, that's the main reason why I did or do or will do <laughs> meditate um, <laughs> because I noticed that it kept me more in the present moment and it, it really lowered those ruminating thoughts from happening. Um, do you find that those thoughts, um, like, you know, you travelled through mm. Asia a fair bit. Yeah. Did you find that you had less or more of the rumination during your period of just travelling? Yeah, so the ruminating, truth be told, the ruminating has only actually happened the past two years. So it all began, I don't want to go too long into it. So basically I, I got into a relationship uh, with my best friend, wasn't working out. I then got really anxious about it because I'd known her for so many years. I was working with a family um, started getting really anxious about it. That's when my like anxiety really got bad. And then one day I realized that I couldn't picture her face in my mind. It was really weird. Um, that got me really more anxious. And what happened was I then started to try and think over and over again a memory of her so I could try and picture her face. But then what happened was because I couldn't do it, it made me more anxious and then it became a subconscious pattern. Then my mind was doing it on its own without me wanting to do it. So then I was going 24-7 every day, boom, thought, thought, thought of my ex-girlfriend trying to get a f- of like a photo of her face in my mind. And it got to the point where I was no longer in control of my mind. It was doing it on its own. I couldn't sleep. I, 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 I would go nights without sleeping at all because my mind just wouldn't rest or I'd maximum get one hour sleep a day. Um, I got addicted to cigarettes because it was the only thing that was um, relieving me of the anxiety feeling for about 20 seconds and then I'd have another cigarette. Um, so that's where it kind of began. And ever since then... It hasn't, it's gotten better. Like now I can sleep, now I can work, now I can do whatever I want, play golf, be more in the present moment. But I will have times where if there's something that I'm not sure about, it's normally uncertainty, which is a problem. If there's something that I'm not sure about, whether it's work related or let's say, for example, a philosophy question, what's the meaning of life or what's the meaning of happiness? Like um, my mind can get fixated on that a lot. And it will just be continuous 24-7. And realistically, there's nothing I can do about it except from just to let it happen and just to give in to it because the more I try and force it to go away or the more I like actually attach myself to those thoughts, mm. the worse it gets. Um, so it's something that uh, OCD, there's not really a cure for it really either. There's tools like... There's tools that you can do to try and help. Meditating is a great one. Um, also, just continuing on with your life. You have to continue with your life. You can't let it take over your life because if you do, that's when it becomes really debilitating. Like I'm interested to know as well because uh, for I suspect, or well, when I find someone has uh, an issue such as like you know your OCD, the ruminating thought, the thing that 
can both be sort of like a huge flaw in you know the the, the normal life that we'd maybe like to lead sometimes yeah. is there have you found like a bit of a superpower from it as well is there a is there a shining light that goes look it's a not a great thing for all mm. these reasons but there is a, an upside to 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 it um i think f- so there's a few things so for me it definitely the superpower i wouldn't say superpower but something that it brought out of me more was talk being t- to actually talk to people more about it and mental health in general um, I know when people hear mental health and stuff like that, it's it's a bit, you know, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a bit... Um, wooey? Yeah, it's a bit wooey. And don't, don't get me wrong, sometimes when you listen to it, it is, you know, because it, it, it's not the most uprising, positive thing <laughs> that you're going to listen to, you know. But it's when you're speaking to people that are going through similar things that you really kind of relate and connect with them more. And f- when you hear someone that is maybe struggling with their mental illness and you're not struggling with it yourself, you don't understand it. And it's something that you can easily just go, yeah, okay, mate, whatever, you know, whatever. But when, when you're kind of going through it yourself, you're like, yeah, I definitely understand, mate. You are going through a tough time. Like, I know, okay, you've called in sick to work or whatever. I understand. Like, it's it's not, oh, mate, just because you're feeling down or whatever. It's like, no, there's feeling down and then there's feeling down, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know? So, and same with anxiety. There's feeling nervous about something and then there's feeling very anxious, you know? And it has physical effects on you, you know, you, you're sweating, you, you're, you're, you're shaking, you know, it's where it's not like butterflies your first day of school, you know, it's like, it, 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 it's, it's even things like trying to think properly, you're trying to like sort things out at work or whatever, but you're so anxious, your brain's not even working properly, you, c- you can't even do the task in hand that you probably do day in, day out normally, so. So you can, for yourself personally, mm. you're able to easily define the difference between when you're just feeling nervous yeah or like maybe i don't know if you'd classify it like low level anxiety compared to yeah. something that's a bit more debilitating like you you sort of can feel that distinction mm. pretty yeah easily. of course i mean with anxiety as well like low level anxiety and stuff like that you're probably gonna for, for me for example i know when i when i'm anxious because i yawn a lot so like a, a, a very common uh-huh. yeah so like a very common th- uh symptom of anxiety is yawning so a lot of the time yawning like is it a normal like your normal style of yawn or does it feel a different yawn so it's it's it feels like a normal yawn and what what it is is basically when people are anxious they're normally not breathing in enough oxygen so your body forces you to yawn to then get enough oxygen into you so that's why sometimes some anxious it's not for not everyone that has anxiety or whatever will do this thing but for some people, it, it's just a way for their body to get more um, oxygen in. So for me, that's just a sign, uh, one of the signs. Um, super, when you're super anxious a lot of the time, you you become more avoidant, right? You're cancelling work, you're not meeting friends, you're not doing the hobbies that you always do and stuff like that. You're normally bed-bound. Um, even friends and family, you're just like... I don't, I don't want to see them, you know, even though they love you, they care for you, and they want to help you out. It's like, you know, I, I don't want to go near them, not because you don't want to, but you almost feel like you're afraid to go near these people, even though j- you're, you're afraid to go near them because you don't feel okay. So you're like, oh, like, I don't feel okay. I don't want to go near these people if I'm not feeling okay. Like, I want to feel okay if I want to go near, near the people that I care about, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, So... And the the another th- thing going back to like good things about like ruminating anxiety is it's a good th- it's it's a good way for me in a sense of it makes me more aware it, it it develops more awareness for me because it forces me to have to have more awareness because like I said you can't let it ruin your life so it forces you to have more awareness in in a sense and. Yeah, it just makes you more relatable to people as well, I guess. Yeah, people, other people going through it. So, a little bit of a sidestep, I guess. But coming back to since you've come to Oz, seeing as we've just done a mini psychology session with one another. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you've been here since December. Yeah, since December the third. And for anyone that is thinking about coming to Perth, are there any things I guess that you? 
have been doing since. So you've been here really just through the summer at the moment. Yeah. Um, are, are there any things that you're like, oh, this is a really good reason why I guess people should consider coming to Perth mm. or uh, things that you've done that you're like, you know, I don't know how much research you did before coming as well. Yeah. But yeah, is there anything at the moment you're like, oh, that's a, that's a really good thing to come and do? I think if you're looking to come to Perth, you're, or, or really anywhere in, in Australia, you you want to come because you're looking for something different, whether it's social-wise, whether it's uh, adventure-wise as well. Um, you want to, you want to, you don't want to go somewhere and they've got the same things in your home country or your hometown, right? Because you, you want the new experiences. Like, that's why, for example, for me, like, I moved over here because I wanted new experiences. I wanted to be able to have the experience of socialising with people more my age. I wanted the experience of, well, to go and see the wildlife because there's wildlife that you can't get anywhere else in the world as well. Um, and p- the thing that I love about Perth as well is... People love comedy over here. Like, there's so many comedy venues, especially down in Fremantle and stuff like that. Um, love going to comedy shows. Um, I'm just trying Would to think. Would you ever do a stand-up minute? Do you know what? Every time I go to a comedy show, I'm always like, oh, just do a minute, do a minute. And there's been a few times where like, I'm at home or, I've, or I'm driving. <laughs> I'm just, this sounds so sad, but I'm driving home. And I'm like pretending to put on like a minute act. <laughs> Good man. Um, and yeah, because I would love to, because I know sometimes off the bat, like when I'm speaking to people, I will say funny things. But it's then when I'm trying, like sitting down, trying to think of funny things. To, and it, that's the difficult part is when yeah, you're sitting down. I and more comes naturally to me, um, but I think as well if you do a comedy show in Australia, like Australians love a good joke as well. They're not they're not easily offended at all. So really, a lot of things, like offensive wise, are on the table to say. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think you can but get as long as it's lot. not like racist. <laughs> well, oh no, let's be real. The best comedians throw racist jokes. 100%. They do. And, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And nonce jokes and stuff like that. And long, it's just going to be funny. That's, yeah, exactly. It's just if you're going to funny. if you're going to a comedy show and you're easily offended, then you're in the wrong place. Yeah, you so probably should not. It's go. as simple as that. Like if you can't take a feminist joke or something like that, then I'm sorry, but you you're just not in the right place. Like go sign up to the Just Stop Oil, I know, protest or something cuz yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh for 2024, mm. um uh, do we think that we might see Jordan doing a, a minute? Do we think it may be a thing this year or I don't know, shall we? Like I don't know. Sh- I guess so. I don't. Why not? As well, like I said, like uh, coming to Australia as well was to build up my confidence. That's another great way to do it as well. It forces me to stand in front of a bunch of strangers and just talk absolute shit. If we know? get if we get a single person to leave a comment that says comedy, we'll both do a minute stand up. Yeah. If we, if yeah, fine. If we both do it, I'll hundred percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean. yeah no. And do you know why? There's there's a good thing as well because there's a science that if if you make a promise to another person, you're more likely to go through the task than if, as if you was going to make the promise to yourself and do the task. So because humans naturally hate feeling guilt, so we will feel more guilt if we let someone else down than if we let ourselves down. Yeah, okay. So, so we shouldn't let each other down. Then. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let each <laughs> other down. Yeah, yeah. Because I, like, I funnily enough have, I watch a lot of Kill Tony. Don't know yeah, if brilliant watched. in it. It's really good. The bucket pools. I'm like, oh, all right, I can do better than all of those yeah, people. Yeah. You like, ever watch? Surely. Oh, some of them are awful. Some like, of them are awful. Like, there's a, but there's again, a bunch where I definitely couldn't do better. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, oh, they, you, the difference between, like, if you're going to put your name in the bucket, yeah. well, like, and let's just say, I'm not even talking about Kill Tony, but if you're going to do a minute of stand up, mm. uh, surely you've just got some material that yeah. you're just, you know, like yeah, the number of people that have gone up and been yeah. like, ah, oh, I didn't do anything, like no prep. Like, what are you do- What are you thinking? Yeah, but then again, though, they probably did, but 
when you're s- oh, yeah, standing true. in front you're of thousands of everything. people, like I wouldn't be surprised if I gave that a go and I fainted. <laughs> like honestly, <laughs> like because I've seen, I've like I watch some Kill Tony and I see people and then they just turn white as a ghost and their yeah. just mind goes blank and they can't think of anything. And then on top of that, you've got them then taking the piss out of you on the side. <laughs> you know, yeah, like you're, you're say something, say something. You're not gonna be able to say anything. But you ever watch any of like that Adam? Adam Ray, yeah, uh, Doctor Phil. Phil, unbelievable. So good. That right now, that is the pinnacle of comedy in my opinion. We'll be right back. <laughs> we'll be right back. No, we'll keep it right here. We'll keep it right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I, I'm obsessed with. It. Yeah. What a great idea as well. Like, it's brilliant. It, it's done very, very well, and he he just puts on such a great performance. And he's actually just he's just very funny. Yeah. as well. You do you know? have, do you watch any of his other stuff apart from the Doctor Phil? Or? Nah, I have. Well, I only came onto him because of Killed Tony, so oh, right, I'm like okay. new to Adam Ray's. But I've watched a little bit of his stuff right, okay, since, okay. but very small amount. I'm, yeah. I'm mostly Killed Tony, Shane Gillis, Matt McCusker as well. Yeah. So like, uh, uh, watch any like the Andrew Schultz podcast? Or um, I'm not as big a fan of Andrew. Oh really? Like, I think he's very, very good from a stand-up point of view, but his interview style and his like extreme laugh and everything. I don't know. A lot of the time, I'm like, yeah. Like it, it, yeah, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't quite hit me the same way <laughs> okay. as some of the other content that yeah, I yeah, like yeah. out there. But he he's recently done that with, yeah, he he did it with someone that I actually have wanted to watch because something was oh he he did one with uh, little Dicky okay yeah yeah and yeah. Theo Von uh, uh, this is maybe a little bit going too far into the weeds yeah. but Theo Von has already spoken publicly that little Dicky stole Theo Von's jokes oh like, really yeah oh, particularly over that. um the very popular little Dicky show I forget what it's called all oh, right so Theo Von said this like publicly and it looks like this is the first time I've seen it talked about and Andrew Schultz brought it up with little Dicky oh, right. so that's one of the only t- like now there's something that I'm like I want to see yeah, yeah, what he yeah, said yeah, yeah. but yeah on, on the whole I don't find uh, Andrew's pod yeah. as good as some of the other yeah, yeah. pods out there so I haven't really gotten into him so much mm. but is that a big fan? Uh, yeah, yeah I'm a big fan of Andrew Schultz so I I kind of get where you're coming from as well because a lot of the time as well they can go really off topic and start talking about like NFL and stuff like that like I was watching one today and there was just a lot of sex segment was just talking about NFL and I was like yeah this ain't that funny but <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah like but, Maybe um, it's kind of like us talking about meditation and stuff. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, this, uh, I, I, listen, guys, I'm <laughs> yeah. so sorry about, like I said, like, when we're talking about stuff like that, like sometimes there's a bit woo-woo. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> listen, but we are going to do a minute stand-up. I think we're going to say it now live on it. We are going to do a minute stand-up each. We're shaking hands. Shaking it's done. hands. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Well, I've, uh, I've already got because it was two weeks ago on an airport flight home yeah. I was thinking about it like what could I write yeah, what yeah. could I like try and do so I've already got the theme that I'm doing oh it. thank god I thought you were about to say well I've actually funny enough to already booked myself into a comedy skit in well, a couple of weeks uh, if you want to join I was like oh no not this soon I, I think it'd have to be yeah maybe two weeks time we can yeah, do yeah. it yeah, sure, yeah. No problem. <laughs> Listen, get me on that stage. You put me the get me the most uncomfortable scenarios ever. Yeah. That's well, it's, it's not going to be comfortable for me either. So as much yeah, as yeah, I yeah. may be outgoing for a group of people, that'll yeah. still scare the shit yeah. out of me. So don't worry. It's not like I'm going to be up there being like, <laughs> easy. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be up there also yeah. shitting my dad. I'm going to do a 10-day Vipassana before that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have a look. Just but I, I honestly reckon... About two weeks' time on maybe a Wednesday. I think there's a Wednesday open comedy mic yeah. uh, somewhere. So All right, okay. We'll, we'll look into it. A minute. A minute's very doable, even if you stand up there and just yeah. shit yourself. Oh, are we allowed we'll to have like a little cheat sheet? You can do whatever you oh, like. Okay, okay. 100%. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. However you want to do it. Again, it's like it's like the um, the meditation. The goal isn't to be good at it. It's just to do the repetitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to get up there. What gonna if we do become comedians after this? That'd be so funny. Oh, my God. Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> imagine we become comedians after this. Hyper successful comedians. Uh, yeah. Yeah, look, well, look, it's possible yeah. with your support, guys. Yeah, your support. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely, it, it is down to the public. It really is. Yeah. So. Ultimately, we'll be we'll figure out whether or not we're funny. Probably won't be, yeah. but we'll we'll see. I'll I'll try and do a <laughs> look. If we do do it, I'll try and get a little recording of it. How would I do it? I've got some little mini those little road microphones oh, yeah, yeah, from the beach. So yes. 
That could yeah. be a way to do it. Maybe they'll let us do it that way. Maybe. And then why not? If we have a bad comedy gig, let's just put it online as well. <laughs> oh, dude, that's probably that's way better content. People love it when you fail at comedy as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although it would be definitely a little bit of a hit to the pride. But, oh, you know, again, that's all just, part of removing some of that ego, I guess, hey? Yeah, 100%. And then we can just get super pissed afterwards. Yeah, well, f- fun fact, I don't drink. <laughs> so, oh, no drinking at all? Yeah, okay. no, I, I, don't, I don't drink at all. And sometimes I think to myself, like, you fucking idiot. Why would you come to Australia? It's known for the drinking and you don't drink. But it's more just like a, a mental health thing. So that's why I don't drink. So oh, good man. But yeah. So shout out to my non-drinkers. It's not easy, <laughs> but... It's all right. Well, yeah. uh, I'll uh, I'll try and avoid having any liquid courage beforehand just so we're no, even. No, listen, I don't mind. You, you drink away, mate. Uh, I, if anything, <laughs> I enjoy being around drunk people. Like, it's 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 so entertaining. Like, the, the steps of no drinking goes like this. Like, you stop drinking. You're like, oh, yeah, I feel so good. Then you go out for a couple of times, not on the drink. You think everybody's so fucking annoying and pissing you off. And then you're like, I'm never going to go out again. Then you give it a couple more tries and then you kind of see the funny side to it. And then you're like, wow, everyone's retarded when they're drunk. (laughs) Like (laughs) this shit's so fucking funny. Like it's a free comedy show every night. (laughs) You know, you're like, oh, like watching that person spew all over themselves or people getting into stupid fights. Or my favorite is you see couples arguing about the stupidest things ever and they go in hard at each other <laughs> like they do like talking about breaking up and shit like that which they would never say to each other so, when they were yeah. sober so uh, <laughs> yeah i do enjoy going how long how long have you been sober for now uh so i've been sober for about two years now yeah about two years so i will say i will admit if it's a special occasion like um like a a Christmas day or something like that, I will have a glass of champagne yeah, and, okay. and that's it. Um, you yeah, phony. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless, unless it's a special occasion, which to be honest, I don't have many it, like Christmas or it's like a big birthday, like my mum's 50th or something. I'll have one glass of champagne, but that's it. I won't actually go out the night drinking or if yeah, I go sure. out for meals whenever I don't order drinks so you have the glass of champagne it's not you like it's not like you've broken the seal and you're like oh give me everything yeah no 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 yeah, it's like yeah. that, that, that's it and, and that's it uh, because normally it's normally tradition as well when it's Christmas day people like families have like the bottle of champagne out and stuff like that so and most of the time it's not even a full glass of champagne it might just be like half because I don't really like champagne the taste so it's just for respect as well because everyone else is doing it so but yeah Low key phony. <laughs> listen, my name's my name's VP. So you, oh no, your name's VP. Damn you it! Can, you, you can go vice pope, man. I'll I'll give you the. Vice I'll be pope. VVP vice vice pope. Oh, I th- I feel like the vice pope would probably have to be uh, pro chastity. You know, like was that the right pro thing? chastity? Like yeah, you got no wear sex. chastity belt. Yeah, no sex allowed. Yeah, is that for the kids or not? <laughs> Well, that's a whole different story. We'll be right back. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> um, well, look, uh, it has been, I think we're up to about two hours now, which is pretty elite. Yeah, wow. Um, so I guess maybe before we, we shoot off, and uh, honestly, this has been super fun. Yeah, it's been really cool. Um, is there anything, I guess, and I think I actually asked this of you recently as well, but is there anything, one, you'd like to, I guess, share with whoever may be listening or is there any uh, piece of advice in particular for someone that is thinking about coming over or just travelling in general? Mm. Uh, I recommend to anyone, guys, if you haven't been to Australia or you're thinking about going to Australia, do it. There's really no reason not to do it. Like, you have nothing to lose. If you're worried about financial work stuff like that there's plenty and plenty of work here if you're worried about making friends or traveling on your own there are so many ways to meet people like harry is put on events that's how i met harry for example there's a bunch of facebook groups there's like w- way tree as well is a is a another great way that you can Ooh, meet people out. find out uh, things to do in australia as well and there's really no way. You're going to see things that you've never seen before. You're going to experience things you've never experienced before. And unless you get eaten by a shark, like we hear all the time in the Western world, which you're probably not, 
come over. <laughs> you have to come over and do it. Look, yeah. we do have some sharks, but you yeah, know, yeah. And to be fair, like shallow areas. I was at a beach once, and there was a hammerhead shark. I wasn't near it, but it was there. But listen, the lifeguards are all top notch. They know what they're doing. We got plenty of helicopters. Yeah, going up plenty of helicopters. Jesus, Just checking Christ. checking it out. I thought it was on like a James Bond movie. The helicopters came out of nowhere, sweeping close to the water with the sirens on. I was like, shit! Like they really, <laughs> they're serious yeah, about yeah. sharks. And but look, um, what I what I'll finish off with as well is, uh, are you single, Jordan? Yes, I'm single, look. ready to mingle, girls. So <laughs> let me know. Well, it's, um, uh, it's not like either of us are hyper famous, successful, or anything no. of that nature. But if someone just liked the the chat yeah. that was going on, uh, would anyone be able to reach out to you anywhere in particular, Jordan? Yes, um, you don't have to either. Um, so my just throw in my Instagram uh, at Mr. Jordan Percival. P E R C I V A L. That is fancy. That's my int- yeah. It's got kind of the surnames like a very old, goes back to the knighthood. I'm not boosting myself up. <laughs> um, <laughs> but basically, but, but you're listen, a girls. Before legend. we get famous, you at least want to tell the people. Oh, I I knew him before he got famous. <laughs> okay, before he co- became a comedian. Um, Did you say Mr. Percival? Yeah, Mr. Percival. Mr. Percival. So yeah. I'm pretty sure that's one of our famous uh, movies in Australia called Storm Boy. And he names the Pelican, Mr. Yes. Percival. Yes, it is. Yeah. And funny enough, you bring that up because my my um, one of my work bosses, he actually answered the phone. He went, oh, hello, Mr. Percival. <laughs> and then I went, oh, you're right. And he goes, yeah, funny, funny your name's Percival. I was just watching a movie and there was a Pelican or something <laughs> called Percival. And he goes is it a really common name or old name? And I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> I was like, it doesn't really originate from a pelican, but we'll go with it. <laughs> I will forever now yeah, I was save like, your this contact. This is my sign that I'm meant to be in Australia. <laughs> I will now forever save your contact with Mr. Percy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> cool, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jordan. Yeah, cheers, guys. Epic. Thanks for listening. We'll Cheers, see you into next time. We'll see some uh, comedy coming out soon. Yeah. <laughs>